That's what I'm talking about. What's going on, everybody? Welcome, Arvanauts. Welcome all to a Saturday night stream. It is about 7.25 p.m. Eastern, and it is episode 30 of Masters of the Dungeon, our D&D roundtable, which we do here every month, uh, once a month. And I am very excited to chat with my co-host, who I will introduce in just a moment, uh, about what's going on in the world of tabletop gaming and a couple of other things related to this. So we will talk about that uh, in just a bit. But before we get there, and then later on tonight, of course, some d and with viewers. But before we get to all of that, just a couple of reminders about ways to support us here. If you haven't done so already, please follow the channel. Please check out our YouTube with exclamation point ArvTube, our Discord with exclamation point ArvCord, our Twitter with exclamation point ArvTweets. Our website for all of that is ArvanElleron.com. On the financial side, as I mentioned last night, the Patreon uh, begins continues to tick back up. So we're looking at 22 patrons, 239 per month now, which is great. The higher that gets, the better it is because I can put more money back into the channel in a variety variety of ways, so any help uh, would be much appreciated on that score. You can get good stuff for yourself as well, including uh, copies of my band's albums, including a professional writing critique, including an epic character background, an epic poem written for you, and stuff like that. So all of that is possible, plus it moves, of course, the channel forward, and you can also get inspirations for the players in our tabletop campaigns. So you can do that by supporting us over at exclamation point Arvtreon. On the shop, we have exclamation point Arv Shop, which is the merchandise area. We've got stuff for Infinity and Beyond, and of course, for Adventures of Middle-Earth and soon to be Esper Genesis as well, so you can pick up some swag there. And on the sub front, we've got that sub button, uh, which is sitting there in the video window uh, and allows you to subscribe to the channel. You can get those awesome DRM-free emotes, those custom sub badges and all that kind of good stuff, plus, again, inspirations to be able to help the players. So thank you for all the support, and if you haven't already done so, please consider jumping on board to support us in that way, also by spreading the word about the channel. On the publishing front, exclamation point Icarus will give you details about my Icarus graphic novel being released on November 10th in retail by Athis Arts. I'm very excited about that. Exclamation point library is Tales and Tomes from the Forbidden Library, uh, the 5e adventure and source book uh, where you can pick up uh, copies of that, which is from Alligator Alley Entertainment. Print edition of that is coming soon. The digital version is already in PDF um, over at Drive Through RPG, where it is a silver seller, and I am very excited for more. I was actually just over at Dungeon Masters Guild, which is a sister site to Drive Through RPG to pick up our adventure for this evening um, after uh, the show is over, after Masters of the Dungeon is over. Uh, but you can support us over there. And uh, again, Alligator Alley is going to be a big deal for us going forward because they're also going to be publishing the Grayshade RPG, which is being designed by Aaron Rosenberg and which is a part of the Grayshade Kickstarter coming out starting on February 2nd, 2021 is the Kickstarter launch date for that. So again, very excited about that. More details to come. So please uh, make sure that you jump on board to find out more details about that. And last but certainly not least, exclamation point BLM, Black Lives Matter. We have continued to push this and will continue to push this uh, from the last few months. We're going to keep pushing as we go forward because, again, it has never been more important um, to acknowledge the importance of black lives and sustaining and supporting them. And so that is a link that will give you educational resources, information about political advocacy, and, of course, places where you can donate um, to various places to support Black Lives Matter. So please jump on board there. And please also hit that exclamation exclamation point vote now link so that you can go over and make sure that you're registered to vote and that you can see where and when you can vote at that uh, betterknowaballot.com. Many thanks to Isterma for giving us the details about that last link, by the way, so that we were able to add this on as well. Uh, last thing I want to mention just very quickly, I've been talking about this a lot, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this now, but I do want to mention to everybody that if you have not done so already, please consider as well uh, checking out this place, this um, Athis Arts uh, anthology in this moment. Moment, um, which has only got another, I think it's 12 days to run, currently sitting at 4437, so they have a long way to go before funding. They have 150 backers, so they have a lot of people that have jumped on board, which is great, but there's a lot more work for them to do if it's going to get funded, and as I've been saying, I think this is not only a good antho, but it's an important anthology, so hopefully people can jump on board and support that, um, and support a great press, uh, Maurice brought us a great editor, and a great set of authors and contributors um, to that as well, because all of that would be appreciated. So consider jumping on board there. Otherwise, schedule-wise, we've got Masters of the Dungeon now, and then once that is complete, we will be moving on to D&D with viewers, where I have a special adventure planned for those of you who will be jumping on board. Uh, that is very Halloween themed and it is called the House of the Midnight Violet. I'm actually excited to run this. So I'm looking forward to it and it's going to be good times and so we'll see about that. Oh, there's a Stargate role-playing game. Oh, cool. Well, I will have a chance to talk more about that. But 
Before we do any of that, I'm going to unmute myself uh, so that my co-host knows that we're ready to go. And then I'm going to jump over to say hello uh, to my friend and compatriot uh, on this show and in Curse of Strahd and in the Our Vocalists. Uh, and that, of course, is Little Red Dot. Um, Dot, it's great to see you. And uh, before I let you introduce yourself and talk about yourself, I'm just going to say, for those of you who don't know, I mentioned this before, but this is going to be Dot's last appearance on this show um, because uh, Dot has just got so much stuff. She is uh, her sorry, gang. is blowing up. And you not know, how about this? Not the last one ever. Right. Not okay. the last one ever. That's good. Okay. Yeah. You will never see her again. No. Um. Uh. Yes. I'll not be the last back to this ever. show at some point. Dot yes. just has um a big thing coming down the pipeline, and She's I need to make some room for, for it. Bit. Um, yeah. yeah, and I mean, and I really mean that like Dot uh, over the last year or so um, has just been, I, I just really enjoy having her on all the various things that she does here because she's smart and a good person and just like really great within this space. So, uh, you know, I want to say Thanks, thank Sarah. you for being a part of this. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I look forward to that day when we can have you back. But fear not for those of you who are like, wait, never. First of all, you'll see her on a lot of different ventures, um, but you will also see her on this channel still with your vocalist because I don't think she can get away because that's. It's too, I mean, so many fun I love that show so much. You know what I tell people? I was like, don't get me wrong. Like, I've really come to love Infinity and Beyond, obviously. <laughs> um, I've fallen in love with all Agatha uh, and that, the whole experience. And, like, <clears throat> this is always fun because, you know, you and I are really great at shooting this shit. Like, we can talk forever. Yeah. So, like, we're just really good at it. But I have a really special place in my heart for our vocalist, <laughs> like a really special place because it's it's not like anything else that I do. It's it's the only thing like it that I do. And I love it. I yeah. love it. I yeah. always show up. I always not that I don't always show up and have a good time. But like I have a, I have a particularly special good time when I show up <laughs> for our vocalist. It's like, it reminds uh, me of like what Rob that. says, because everyone always just like everyone laughs and has a good time. And I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, it's just an easy way to shoot the shit and play a video game and chill and do silly, ridiculous voices uh, with like no. Care. Yeah, it's just um, it's a joy. And joy is a value that I hold dear in my life. So uh, we need more joy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to say that up front. And now that I've done that and only semi depressed everybody, um, <laughs> I will, uh, I will uh, head over to uh, say hello to Dot. Dot, how are you? How's how's life in the world and the universe with you on, on your side of our little planet? Uh, you're part of the planet. You know, it. Uh, well, it's still connected to this planet, which means it's burning, uh, like yeah. everything else. But, True. <laughs> True. but, uh, uh, there's some exciting things coming down the pipeline, uh, which is pretty cool. And you know what? It's almost time to vote, so I'm going to say, please vote, everybody. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, that means this year's almost over, y'all. Oh, we survived 2020. Um, I'm not going to jinx it, but that's, that's, <laughs> right. say, that's where, that's really? where, that's where my hopes and dreams lie right now. Like, yes. What will it be yes. to bring in a new year? Yes. To have that fresh, just perspective is what I'm hoping. And um, there it is. There it is. What I wouldn't give for a camping trip. Oh my Lord. I've missed every camping trip. Every festival, every bird this year. Mm -hmm. Y'all, I'm Dot. Uh, these things matter to me. Uh, and Every I, con um, was blown pretty much. Every I convention. Yeah. I am just like, uh, oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I just need like loud music and a, a bit of a dance pit and maybe like some inebriation. Like I need all of that. Like I need, <laughs> I need to just go like out and party a little. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, 2020 killed my party. Um, it chopped off my mullet. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. It ruined my it ru mullet. There's a quote. It ruined Dot's mullet. <laughs> Dot's party mullet is destroyed. <laughs> I don't even... That's got to be the name of your next tribute band is Dot's party mullet. Like, Dot's, party Dot's party mullet. Dot's party mullet. It's got to be a tribute band. Like, how good is that? Oh, man. Um, and it's a ZZ it Top uh, tribute and it's band, a, obviously. It's definitely a ZZ Top cover. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, uh, for sure. Um, well, they're... I, and I'd introduce myself, but I feel like I just said everything I need to say about myself in a few <laughs> sentences. Um, I'm Dot. I'm really, I'm both sad and glad to be here. I'm glad to be here to chat today. I'm sad that this will be the last one for a little bit, but not forever and always. So, because I'm always around this channel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got I got my hooks in her just enough. To... <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I'm always around. 
Um, but no, I, I, and who knows? I'm... Arv made, Arv made a big old pitch right before we went live. That was like, Oh, dot, you know, if you wanted to come over and run something on the channel, I'd be like, Oh, okay. Arv. My so, secret you know, to whatever success I may or may not have is that I am surrounded <laughs> by good and talented people who I try to make pitches to like, do you want to show your good talent to more people and as many people as possible? Because here's a way you can do that. And then they're like, well, I'm good and talented. Maybe I should do that because I mean, and honestly, part of it, I mean, you know, the drill with, with what I try to do with my channel. And I think it's very similar to what you've talked about with your own community and your channel. I think I, I, I really want to bring... I want to model a little bit like what I think yeah. the world in general does. This is what you do in group therapy is to try to model out outside life. And I try to do that because I really think I, I, I just like I, I obviously like having good people and friends, but they're also they're not just friends. They are people who really know and understand the value of what it is we do. And they don't dismiss it with like, oh, whatever, like it's fun to just kind of screw around like it is fun to screw around, but it's also there's there's something serious about putting together you know good storytelling and bringing people together in a way that's inspirational and I've seen yeah. you know you do this on your own channel with a lot of the games you manage you know the about I guess it was about a month ago somewhere within the last month where you were doing the um, good strong hands um, yeah the thing. one for Craig yeah for I was the, very moving uh, you did a really good job with it it was very moving oh, and thanks. I think it's moving because you took it seriously as much as it's also a game and obviously but right. I, I so I appreciate that so yes I I am. I am hoping I have a f I, that's why I did the Maybe pitch. Maybe we'll talk and, about that you know. game today. Maybe I'll talk about that game today then. I would love to. Oh yeah, I would actually because I found that striking. Really Not nothing again. The aliens game is cool too, except <laughs> because me personally, I'm like it's very scary. Good luck with that. Like I'm Bye. I'm not gonna be yeah. freaked out by that. But no, I mean I'll like how about this? I'll save the aliens game for a couple really choice moments. Um, sure. I'll oh, no, tell you, you can why of I'm really. Cite it. I'm I'll tell you. I'll it. tell you why I'm really enjoying the, uh, the aliens campaign, and then a couple really choice moments that have come out of it. Um, and then, but I'll save our game chat. I'll save the game chat for good strong hands because I think it's a really beautiful game. So okay. We'll, we'll cool. Save that. I look. I look forward to that. Um, but anyway, always a pleasure to have Dot with us. So, um, so I guess actually, and let's let's start there because um, that's that's a good place to begin, which is something that happened in our campaigns uh, okay. over the last month or so. I mean, do you wanna do you wanna talk about that about what it was like um, doing the let's good see, strong okay. hands thing oh yeah so um good strong hands i believe that it's still on kickstarter through the end of the month I'm gonna um go check that. i believe if you want to get your hands on it so it okay. definitely is a fantasy game and but has has that feeling good strong hands of like the kind of 80s style fantasy where the world is being darkened by something. It's being corrupted, right? The dark crystal vibe. or Five the, days the, to go, the, by the way. So five yes. days. There we go. Five days. You know, never ending story. It has these, it has these, it has a feel of epicness to it, which I really love. Yep. But, but the, the, um, the written game as is, is also very, very interesting. And the characters the the this this kind of corruption this darkness is drawn to these powerful characters so the more successful that you are the more likely it is that it's going to see you notice you take note of you yeah. and therefore attempt to corrupt you further because you're powerful and you're strong and you're brave um and so there's this really interesting dynamic that's being played in that that when you choose to do the right thing you also right okay we want to just talk about frodo right Prime example, when you choose to take up the burden, you choose to have the eye on you. And that in and itself is a burden. And so it's very similar in that regard. Like once it's it's on you, it tries to corrupt you. It tries to, to you know. That's an excellent comparison. And I, I want to I wanna build on it a little bit. <laughs> I twist my arm about talking about Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> I, I want to build on it because in that game, without spoiling it, if you haven't seen it, you should go, <coughs> excuse me, see it because it's available on the... Vods, you you have you have yeah. It you can get it on my you uh, you can get it on my YouTube. On uh, YouTube the, okay. the it's it's a three parts. It's three short like hour and ten minute sections. Uh, right. But it's three parts. It's there on my YouTube. Okay, because I was gonna say because without spoiling it, there is a moment where sacrifice becomes something where and and I'm I was struck actually and I was thinking about as I watched it because I lurked and watched some of this and I was struck by uh, this line which comes from Frodo. Um, which is the Shire has been saved, Sam, but not for me. Um, and yep. that idea that some people must give something up so that others may enjoy what that person who gave it up loved about it, right, is a very striking sort of bittersweet thing. And I think 
that is one of the striking things about the game that I noticed with that, and I is is that yeah. there is this sense not just of sacrifice, but that um, you know you there may be times where not everyone you know no person left behind <laughs> where not everyone yep. will be able to make it back, um, and there is a bittersweet quality to that. So I. Uh, that that and that quote came to my mind watching what was going on in yeah. that game. Yeah. Okay. Good. And so, yeah. I yeah. mean, they're 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 you know again without giving too much away, you know, they're marching up the side of a volcano. They're yeah. trying to, they're basically trying to keep a natural disaster that's supposed to happen every hundred years. Trying to make sure it happens. Yeah. That's that and that's a, a, another thing that I was really drawn to about the game was the tie into like nature and the way it talked about the world. Mm -hmm. There is no world lore in the book you make it up on the spot that the game calls for that so at the top you ask each of the characters a question that helps build out the world and you'll see i did that at the very top of this game um and that's how it kind of begins to get created and developed and um the prompt that i use uh, or that of the game that we ran the one shot also came directly out of the book uh there's a bunch of really great like one shot prompts for the game that i thought was really really that's neat. cool so, actually this um and craig's i love craig i love all of craig's games and i thought that was i went through and i was like i could make up my own but this there was something and I'll, i talk about this so i won't say it again um i i talk about at the top of the game how drawn to this one in particular i was based on the current state of our world and the kind of things that we as humans are dealing with and the the sacrifices that we have right made or not made uh to get us into this this place and so um yeah, it was a very, I thought it was a really beautiful kind of telling, telling game and the cast did phenomenal. They picked up on that like big epicness of this story very early on and really knew how to like build and play into that. And it just, um, I don't know, it just kind of flowed. It was a really great experience. So I encourage you to pick up the game. I thought it was really, really cool. And it, it definitely from page to play felt like that epic 80s fantasy, like TV movie, right? Like, like your Dark Crystal uh like your um never ending story it just had that like bigness to it um yep. and that, that kind of fantastical nature that i just was really drawn to so go get your hands on it it's pretty cool good strong hands on it yeah <laughs> i see what you did there um yeah it's it's um it's good stuff and it and and of course good strong hands which is taken from the never ending story um yes. the the, and the thing about that movie, which really summarizes this very well, not only obviously a movie about storytelling, there is a sort of bittersweetness to it. That is also a warning, not only that book, but the movie. Uh, it's a warning mm -hmm. about what happens when you put things to the side. And you have to remember yep. that in the, 19, in the 80s, one of the big things about growing up during that era was this fear that we had sort of surrendered ourselves to a kind of materialistic selfishness yep. that that came you know came forward a little bit with the 70s which was the me generation so to speak but also that there had been this kind of rush towards forgetting about other people and i think some of that is reflected in the rage that you see in the early 90s with grunge music and kind of this this sort of refocused attention on young people being like hey what are we doing um as often is the case young people who generate the energy of we got to do something about what's happening to our world um because they're going to inherit it so it makes sense um but also this sense i think that uh that that uh, of a play of a world potentially in decline and where do you search for a place that actually renews those things? And that movie really is about how we renew things. And it's by going back to basics. It's by going back to, as Dot often says on this and other shows, about storytelling and about seeing the value of storytelling as something which is regenerative. Um, mm -hmm. and, and storytelling is ultimately a regenerative thing. It's something which allows us to reinvent <clears throat> and reimagine ourselves. And so um, I, I really liked the idea that it was picking up on that particular uh, that particular film, and as you said, others at the time, but I mean, that that film in particular is this big inspiration for it. And you're right, mm -hmm. there is an epic kind of quality to it, even in these sort of small moments. So yeah, I was I was very impressed, and that you're right, that's a good one to bring up. Thanks, Art. Um, the one that I'll bring up for me, actually, um, relates to something that came out of a uh, Adventures of Middle Earth session that I had uh, earlier this week. Um, and I've had a lot of really good sessions over the last few weeks from various groups, um, because I'm lucky to have very good players. 
Uh, but the thing that I noticed about this particular one, um, this Adventures of Middle-Earth session, so we have our new kind of assembled group of people, um, Brad Bollier, um, who uh, came in replacing, um, you know, Will, who had left a couple months before, um, has come in and gotten along famously with everybody. Everyone does really well with him and, and this sort of really fit in. And so there are these different threads um, that are picking up on different aspects of the same kind of conspiracy that the party is unraveling, which is a little different from the the big epic fight you know deal with the dragon the spirit of this mm -hmm. this ancient evil spirit that is occupied that works for the necromancer of Dol Guldur and all these things um this is a little bit of a different feel from that although it's going to lead to its own conspiracy down the line but the <laughs> thing that was interesting was there was an npc this seamstress called kelda um that was uh you know very was old and um but was very well respected among the people of dale because she is this exceptional embroiderer for reasons that i can't get into and spoil things but there's reasons that she was um and in particular the thing that she treasured most was this thing that she had been given by her lover many many decades before her lover who then you know passed away which is mm. this silver needle and it's the thing that she treasures more above everything else so the party ran into her at the beginning of this adventure and and then there was a bunch of stuff that happened and they came back and someone is trying to get this needle and trying to get this stuff from Kelda. So when the party, uh, two of the people in the party had gone to find her and found that she was just distraught and despondent and felt like her shop had been ransacked and she's just like, I don't really see really what the point is of going on. So the, the two people in the party, while well, the other two were off doing something else, leave and they see someone spying on them basically. And so they give chase, they catch them. But in the meantime, having both gone after and caught them, that's all part of the setup. And as they found out by interrogating this guy that they caught, the whole reason that he was doing this was so that they would get away. And when they get back, then they, there was a sort of this moment of recognition where they're like, oh, God, crap. They turn around and come <laughs> back and the, the shop is on fire. Um, and uh, so when they go in and they bring her out, Kelda basically passes away in their arms. Um, and it was it was a really nice moment. I had been concerned about the danger. I, I hate trying to railroad or sort of insist something and there was a way if they had not chased them then this wouldn't have happened she probably wouldn't have died there certainly wouldn't have been any attempts to try to set the house on fire um but if they had not chased them then they also wouldn't have known who the big bad guy was at least within this part of the adventure that was ordering all of this um and you know the the feeling that they had was they felt extremely sad total extremely angry at the bandits who did this extremely sad that it happened but they felt that there was a kind of um there was there was a kind of it, it made sense you know there was a kind of a sense that it all worked the way that they might mm -hmm. have expected when they looked back over it um and so it gave them a sense of the bittersweet quality that tolkien tries to represent in his world because not everyone is going to survive. Um, not everyone's going to make it. There will be loss. And even after they've defeated this terrible thing, only a couple of months ago in game terms, like six months ago in game terms, um, there still is danger that exists and other shadows that must be dealt with. And it was nice to see this party, which is battle hardened for the most part and has been through adventures and they're, you know, all level like seven or eight now. So they're, you know, they're moving up the ranks and they've, they've got, so, they've, you know, they're not to be trifled with. They're called the heroes of Dale and yet they still can't save everyone. And that sense of vulnerability and feeling of, oh, wow, well, so the stakes have not really been lowered for them. We can still lose people under certain circumstances. It was great to see, and it was well role played by everybody also. So, um, yeah, that was that was nice to see. And I, of course, I wasn't I wasn't happy about it. Like I don't like killing off a beloved NPC that everyone's like, yes, you know. Um, but I'm just the messenger. Like this is the way these things break down. And now they have a hell of a lot of motivation if they didn't have it already to go get the these things. One of my favorite things in the world is so. to make a cast love an NPC and then take that NPC from them. Yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite thing in the world. Yay. <laughs> no, Norway. I didn't set up a little old lady to die. The bandits set up the little old lady to die. And now this little old lady must be revenged by that that party. That's because... right. There is nothing in the world like taking an NPC from a group of characters that love that NPC. Damn. That's, that's you know, nothing in the world, huh? It's I'm serious. It's always the best setup. And do you want to talk about needing your players or your your characters, your PCs. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're on a DM show. I can get off on a tangent on this. Sure. If you need your PCs to really start caring about something, like to shift motivation and take a deep seated interest into something, uh, 
pluck. Like, for example, in my Coriolis campaign, spoiler alert, um, in my Coriolis campaign, there was an NPC that was just supposed to be an NPC, and they, my players, it, it happened, they, like, latched onto her. She was this kooky surgeon, this kooky doctor. Okay. She, unfortunately, found a bunch of drugs being muled inside of some bodies that she autopsied, and she was attacked and basically killed uh, when somebody came in to take the drugs out of the med lab. They found her moments after she had died and basically brought her back to life. They resuscitated her. But in this game, because it's a dark sci-fi game, um, I've basically written it. They didn't know this at the time. When your body is brought back, a demon can ride you back into this existence and start turning oh, you man. into a jinn. And so when they brought her back to life, and then, of course, they go find her. She's in a psych ward on the main station Coriolis, uh, which is where they eventually, like, track her down to. They moved her over there because everybody thinks she's crazy as shit. Um, and they sign her out. They take responsibility for this this woman and sign her out. And at the very, very end, they had kind of started to figure out she was turning into a gen. And at the very end of season two, they had an artifact, a container a very special container uh, that was said to contain a soul that would bring somebody back to life. And so they brought this character back. But when you, when you vacate a vessel, you have to fill it. And they sucked the doctor because she's a jinn. She's a genie. She's a genie into the container and trapped her there at the end of season two, oh, not yeah. knowing saving another character. And so I was just like, I'm going to just take that from you. I'm going to take this NPC that you have worked so hard. You're trying so hard to save her soul. And there's nothing you can do. She's sharing her vessel with a demon she's turning into a jinn what are you gonna do about it and let me tell you what they are pumped to save her for season three they're like what do we have to do and i was like this isn't even the main storyline like i took her away from you so that you can't have her back they're like uh, no we don't want to give them up well in fairness yeah. rudinelle first of all rudinelle you know rest man i want to make sure you're doing okay because good lord um but it's also, it's an NPC, not a PC. You, Dot would never do this to a PC. No, um, never do this yeah, to never a do PC. It to PC. That's NPC. a terrible idea. But to an NPC. But I think, I, here's the thing I think that's interesting about that. There is a sort of stubborn determination on the part of players sometimes that they're like, no, we don't want to, no, for real, we're not going to lose this NPC. And at that point, you have to really, I think, process as a dungeon, ma as a game master, like, you know what? Maybe there's a way that they don't have to lose that NPC. I mean, like, it, it may mean that they will put themselves at great risk. It may mean that they are going to possibly sacrifice aspects of themselves. But I, of course, I, I try they to care think about, about the possibility now. of it because they care about it. Right. 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 There was so there's one there's one PC in particular who's a little bit of a. He's not very empathetic and he struggles like connecting with people. And obviously she had a total thirst crush on him. Uh, because he's the one that saved her. He's the one that brought her back to life. Mm -hmm. And so there was this cult, kind of whole like depend codependency type thing. And so he treated her like crap when she was there. And now that she's gone, he's made it his mission to figure out how to like bring her back from this container. Yeah. Um, and it's been really interesting watching his character development by putting that kind of kink or cog um, in his storyline, right? Because now he feels guilty for not being nicer. Now he realizes that like, oh crap, somebody actually cared about me. Nobody's ever cared about me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's there was this really cool moment of character development. And so I've been doing in between the seasons, like since this all has happened, these like one-on-one -on -one shots with each of the individual players right to like figure out what they do over a period of a year when all this go after all this goes down and so he has you know it, it was just a way for me to tie in more <laughs> lore and that's kind of what i came the conclusion i came to arv is like i'm not gonna i'm i'll give it her back um at, well there, how about this there's a chance you can save her there's a shot there's a chance there's a shot right and if you want to take that shot it's gonna you're gonna have there's a lot between you and that is is your character do they want it that bad? Like, how bad do they want it? You know, like, I love that uh, putting them on the edge and making them really work for uh, that thing in the story. Right. It keeps the heart pumping. You know what I mean? Yes. Because and, that's what it is, you know? Yeah. And this is a good argument as well for making sure that um, as you're putting together and populating your world with these various NPCs, that when you start playing them, when you start kind of imagining them and, and representing them, um, it's extremely important to leave open the possibility that you might revisit them again. That doesn't mean that you need, you know, every shopkeeper has got to have a 10-page backstory. That's, that's absurd. But but really, you can play off of what your players take of it. If the players really find 
a given particular character to be particularly interesting and they want to know more details about it and then they get into this thing, if you've set it up well enough that there's the potential that they will follow those threads, then that is a character that you can then bring back and that you can then use to build yep. these stakes. And they were the ones who did it, right? They were the ones who made this into someone that mattered. Um, and from a yep. Twitch point of view, streaming it too, if you make that character matter to the players, it will inevitably make that character matter to the viewers because the viewers will yes. take the cues of the players because they identify with the players. The viewers will look at the players and go, you know, whichever one of the players, one of them may or may not identify with, but as a group, they certainly will identify with them. And they'll say, if this is important to that character, then it's got it or that player, then that's going to be important to me to a degree also. And so making sure that you don't just kind of like, you know, half ass. And I, I, how do I put this? How do you, keeping from half assing a, like a shopkeeper, they come in, you start giving them a little bit of an act, just something like a little bit of an accent, like, oh, well, I've got the uh, infinity <laughs> and beyond before Curse of Strahd, when we were doing Tyranny of Dragons, there was a point where the group uh, went into this one shop in a city. So I, on the spot, made up this idea. Um, I had a dwarf running it, and I made up this idea that there were two shops across the street from each other, one run by a dwarven armorer, and the other run by his twin brother, who was a dwarven weapons guy, and they didn't like each other because they were rivals, but at the same time, they had a grudging respect. And I just figured I would do that. Like Literally, that's all I thought about. And then they really loved these guys, and they were like, I want to know more. So I was like, okay, and then their father gave them this, you know, like, and, and over time, um, that was something that they then were able to go back to. We want to go see the Dwarf Brothers and like, right. and, and so more of it was able to happen, not because I did 50 pages of backstory, but because I, I left open the possibility that there's a thread that they may want to tug on. And if they do, then I am able to pull out my, you know, ball of yarn, tie it onto the thread and just keep playing along with it. Um, yeah. So that that's what I mean. Not just sort of the kind of like, well, I'm a shopkeeper, and the, yeah, you know, it's cool to be able to give characters, give players a sense that these characters could have more to them if they want to follow the. It, line, it makes so. them feel one. I find that it makes my players feel like they have more agency in the world. Yes, because yes. they always have somebody they could go talk to, or they have somebody that they uh, can go back and relate. Yeah, with, contacts or, too. You contact, know, like, yeah. yeah, like a contact, a play, somebody with rapport. Um, so that's one piece of it, but it also makes the world feel like it's just functioning. Yeah. Right. Like there can be the, these very surface worlds that are created by things like, oh, there's a bunch of shop stalls and e we know each one is, but when you have these really rich in, uh, uh, NPCs, which is literally my, I'm such an NPC whore. I love them. <laughs> I love playing NPCs. Yeah. Uh, like I would rather talk to you as a GM, as an NPC than I would to just give you narration. Mm hmm and so um, I love them and I love making really kind of quirky and rich characters because one, my players remember them, um, which <laughs> is needed sometimes for important story stuff. And two, it helps them buy the world. It helps them yeah. buy into the world that they're also breathing in and making choices in. Yeah. Um, and uh, it just helps inform so much. It also helps helps the GM remember them too, <laughs> because if also you just like, true. you know what I mean, like you if you have the, they're like that guy who had the one eye and was like, the, I'm like oh yeah, you know, like because oh, sometimes yeah, that like guy. I mean like in a given month, given the number of games that we run and or play in, like so many, I I don't you know, do you remember this guy's girlfriend was in this thing? I'm like I pff, maybe you know this like, is like you know what? So I tell people so, about Free League, um, you know I the Coriolis game I ran about 20% of their first major module. So their first massive module for Coriolis is gonna be three parts. Okay. Uh, the first part, Emissary Lost, was in beta when I started in, then it released and I only got to about 20% of it because of y'all. They have so many NPCs, holy crap, holy. <laughs> in their modules, there's so many people. And I was like, I can't, I as a GM can't even keep up with that many people. Like yeah. I, I cut it down to like, who's important? Right, when we think about the best movies we've seen, Ever. Like the movies that like stick with us, like really great films. It's because it's not because it's usually inlaid with a lot of characters. It's because you get these really in-depth characters. You get these characters that uh, we know a lot about, but there are fewer of them, right? They, right. they they fill that stereotype or they they do that thing that really makes us connect with them. And so I feel like when as a GM, when you're making story, um, it's really important to like pick and choose your NPCs. Even as somebody that likes to do a lot of NPCs, like make sure the really important ones are notable, like you're talking about, both for yourself and for your players. Like it just pings moments along the storyline for them. No, it's very true. Um, and and I think, uh, and, and also just in general, the more you populate a world, 
with characters that are three dimensional, the more three dimensional yeah. the world feels. Like yes, part of world building is the environment, um, and and the you know various aspects. But I think more important than any of it is the people who live within that world, who yep. are influenced and affected by that world, and and they will. Yep. They will provide the world building for mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you know, one yep. one perspective at a time. So, um, all right. Well, I so the topic I wanted to ask about, um, although, again, as you say, this is not a permanent departure, but since you're going to be stepping back for a little while, I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to oh, zoom I... our camera out a bit, and I wanted mm -hmm. to ask a little bit about what you view the current sort of future. We're talking about reboot again. <laughs> What's up, Lone Wolf? Not exactly. But I was wondering if we could um, if we could zoom the camera out and talk a little bit about what we think the future holds for tabletop. And I'm I'm thinking, you know, jump forward like ten years, let's say. Um, what do we think the industry is going to look like? What games will have gained ascendancy? I should say, what types of games will gain ascendancy? Um, where do we see sort of like the streaming environment going in terms of the you know, likely effect uh, that we see? How, are we going to continue to see more of the so-called critical role effect? Are there going to be others? Or is there going to be a retrenchment where people are kind of going to go back to kind of the things they feel comfortable with? Um, and so there won't be as much attention to sort of the online stuff. Um, you know, some of it is hard to tell because we're in the midst of a pandemic, which has driven lots of people online. I was online. about to say, so, so, so hypothetically, the world doesn't come to a resounding yes, let's, halt. Right, over let's the next assume there is a 10 years, years from now. Yes, Let, let's assume um, that we're existing. 10 and years we from go now. back to some level of normalcy. Right. right. Um, hopefully. Um, okay, that's an interesting question. So the first thing that I'll say that we're already seeing, uh, uh, and we may have touched on this before on one of the shows, is um, simpler games. Simpler role-playing games. Sure, yep. Um, that aren't just always like open RP, like y'all know I love to RP, but like different question-based ones. Like I think For the Queen is a great example of yep, that, I right? Yeah, I thought or you might mention that. Uh, what is it, Icarus? Mm-hmm. Is that that one, that world building game where you like build an empire and then watch it fall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so those kind of things are going to become really, really um, important in what we, in in the um, expanse mm -hmm. of TTRPG and how we get more people that aren't acclaimed like d and mm -hmm. to the market. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're already starting to see this shift happen where we're getting a lot more tabletop games that are set in specific universes. Mm -hmm. The Alien RPG, mm -hmm. right, um, is doing that. They're coming out with the Dune RPG. Yep. Uh, we now have a Game of Thrones RPG. We're going to start seeing RPGs um, to be able to capture the market of people outside of, of um, where this all kind of started. Yep. So, for example, we know Renegade has already announced G.I. Joe, Power Rangers, um... Oh, there was another big one in that grouping. And I can't remember what it was. Those are the two titles that are sticking with me. There's a third one that's just like that, right? And, I mean, I was telling all of you, yes, I'm going to say reboot. I was looking at the same thing, Pirates of Dark Water. Right. Reboot. I think we're going to see these games go to this kind of thematic world um, and, and let us be and live in those pieces of media that we all love so much. Um, Transformers. Transformers. That's the Transformers. Other one. That was the other one. Yep. yep. Thank you. I knew there was. Another oh God! And My there. Little Pony. I didn't know and they were doing that. Well, that. They're... Oh man, I have no idea what that's going to look like. But uh... I, okay, so there is a My Little Pony TTRPG. I'll be interested if they're redoing it or right. if they're going to like. Um. So, anyways, I say that <laughs> because I definitely think there's this like, we're already leaning towards that. We're already seeing it, and like, I'm, how easy would it say be for Free League to now make a Predator? Yeah. Tabletop. Yeah right like it's so easy and it's like i would play so i would play the hell out of that i am enjoying the <laughs> aliens rpg so much more than i thought i would now as a complete and total lore junkie for that world yeah that is also one reason why i really really enjoyed the book but like it's really cool and having now played i can't spoil it um in dna but i can tell you that i did get to play test the dune rpg also very cool Right. So for so long, I think with tabletop, what we had was like D and D. Mm -hmm. And then we got these kind then we started to see things like Cypher and Fate come around that allowed us to skin the things that we wanted. Right. Um, right. That we could build the world that we were looking for. Yep. But we were always trying to fit things into Dungeons and Dragons. If I wanted to play a Power Rangers game, I would have gone to find a somebody that had like hacked D and D to make that a reality. Mm -hmm. Versus saying 
what if we just made a Power Rangers game? What if we just made an Avatar of the Last Airbender game? Yep. Right? Um, because d and not always like maybe the right choice, right? For that, it is built a very specific way to tell a very specific kind of story. And right. so I always tell people when we look at any story that is written or told, whether it be from theater to, to, to novels to just, you know, there's a vast spectrum of it. And each one's told a little differently. We've got Brechtian theater and you've got, you know, a uh, theater of cruelty. Uh, and, and, and then you've got, you know, Broadway musicals, like all those yep. things are different and they tell stories in the same, like, uh, umbrella, but they're not the same kinds of stories. No, and I think that's not. what we're going to, you know, our games are beginning to do is they're developing into their own, niche of game types and i think yep. that's it's it's just it's super it's super duper um i'm loving it so i can't say that's exactly where it's going to go but i can say we're already seeing that shift happen we're seeing these game houses these publishers start to produce things lord of the rings right another prime example of a, of a setting and thematic based game that's coming out that's all of its own it's standing all its own so um that is my that that's what I can say to that. As for the twi well, go ahead. No, well, I'll I just before I jump into Twitch. Yeah, yeah. I, I, let me just. I was going to say. So first of all, and I mean, Echo, you know, brought up uh, earlier um, that Stargate uh, has got the own, you know, Stargate. its RPG. Yep. Um, yep. Dragon Spear was talking about the Farscape RPG. Um, there was, and I mean, some of this stuff is a couple years old. There, there's a Leverage um, show. There's a Leverage um, uh, RPG. There's a Firefly RPG that's been around for a while. But I think you're beginning to see more and more, I think you're right, that's focused on these particular universes that can sustain them. I actually think sometimes the universes that are being chosen are not necessarily able to sustain them. Um, oh, yeah, Sticker Glue. There's a Firefly RPG. In fact, I've played yeah. it. Um, I so, played so it at I Gen Con. What, oh, yeah. um, so. I think what I'm seeing is, because some of those are very old, like technically there's a Pirates of Dark Water one that was put out in the 90s, I believe, um, that was garbage. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not very good. And what's happened over time is our game development skills have also developed. Yep. And we're seeing games designed better. And by better writers, and too. More, better by better writers, 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 with more accessibility. Right. We're seeing the structure of how games are created changing based on the need for a market to be able to step into them. Yep. And yep. so that's also changing. It's why we're remaking games. Now we may have, see another Stargate game come out. We may see um, that there is this new phase that's happening. And part of it is because tabletop games have become more accepted. Yep. They have become more accepted. Um, and also and also more commercially viable because of things yes. like Twitch and stuff like that. Now, of yep. course, in our industry, commercially viable <laughs> often means it won't cost people a fortune to actually make it, you know, because the amount of games that are actually making money at a high level, you know, we're still working on that. But but nonetheless, I mean, the one good thing is that this this general fan base tends to be a little more well healed and tend to spend their money on things like this. So you can put out setting books and people who like these games will get this stuff like candy. I mean, and a lot of people talk about the fact that a lot of people get this stuff just to read it. Dot, for example, was talking, doing her, um, I caught a little bit of your GM prep session for uh, the Aliens game that you're oh, running. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of it, you're just looking at the book and you're like, so here's this timeline thing and here's the stuff with the galaxy Yo, map. I was nerding and like, out. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I mean, like, I, I'm completely down with that. Like, that's every time I get one of the Adventures of Middle Earth books, I, I was no. just kind of like, just like, oh, I'm just marveling at the maps, especially the maps. I love the maps. And thinking about every aspect of, you know, here's this spot in the Misty Mountains where this thing was found with this, that, like... And that's what you want, right? You want people sort of nerding out nerd over arm. it. Um, yeah, hey, listen, I, I wear it proudly. It's nice to know that I live in a time where I won't get the hell beat out of me for being one. Right, that's true. Um, yeah, right you know, I hear that. We, we took over. Uh, but th I, think, I think one of the things that's important about that is the passion is what drives, I think, the interest in these universes. So yeah. there's something that like, you know, Fate Core and uh, Powered by the Apocalypse Systems and 5e even, you know, things don't necessarily fully capture all the time. Correct. I have a good friend, Brian Young, uh, who made the Robotech, uh, you know, new Robotech tabletop RPG. And, you know, ro people who love Robotech really, yep. really freaking love Robotech. People who yep. want to play Battle of the Planets, you know, like, or or the G-Force type stuff, like, they, they want that, you know? And there's a sense, I think, that they want something where you just feel like you're swimming in the lore of it 
and the mechanics then are sort of built to you know sort of accommodate that so i think i think you're right that that sort of thing is beginning to happen um also hopefully while making it somewhat accessible for people who really just want to play in that world um, yeah. and no longer yeah. think that the only way to access the world is to watch a film or read a book about it, but actually to play games that are set in that universe yeah. and imagine themselves there. So, yeah. um, you know, that's yeah. that's a big part so, of that. So, I don't know. I think that's a huge part of what, what we're going to see. Now, what does that mean for the future? Well, if some of these gaming comp well, if so, if so, um... yes, yes. Okay. No, nope, yeah, no, me, bring it, me, bring it on. Let, let me, me hear. <laughs> let me see. Let me see how I want to say this. I think if that is actually how things start to go, the smart move for sustainability would be to begin to look at some of these franchises, which is really what they are, uh, that are that are publishing out. And let's be real, a lot of these are being picked up by Modifius, uh, which is technically not a publishing house, y'all. It's it it's a rights it owns the rights right. to things right. is what it does um, and then it and then it puts out from there um, is going to start to see us it, if it really picks up promote within other things right so Marvel puts out a TTRPG that goes along with now the launch of say Marvel movies yeah and so we would begin to in the perfect world see dollars from Marvel going to geek and sundry yep yep um or we would begin to see uh warner brothers hopefully give dot the rights to pirates of dark water give dot the rights to put yes <laughs> you're right um please envision please, a world where brothers. dot has this right dot, these rights. everybody put that out in the universe please um Right, but it's, um, but it's then, true. But it's true because because yeah. just just to jump for a second, it's absolutely true. They should be giving people like you this yeah. because the the value of it. I, I think the value is incalculable for them in a commercial sense because of this reason. Even if you assume, okay, it's kind of a niche audience. How many people? But here's the thing: those people who want Pirates of Dark Water really want everything Pirates of Dark Water, and if they can see a well-run system where people are playing games within that universe, they will flock to buy that yep. stuff and they Let's will buy everything when they you ever the produce. Dune RPG. I cried. I had a literal tear when they announced the Dune RPG. Yeah. So you don't, and that's the thing, you don't need 100 million people buying your product. If you no. get 10,000 people that buy every conceivable thing you would ever yep. put out about that product, you're talking about a lot of money, which <laughs> is consistent. This is, by the way, how Battletech has survived for a long time. Battletech is not this enormous fan base. What it is is an incredibly dedicated fan base, which will spend every cent it can on everything put out by Battletech, yep. which yep. is why our good friend Trendane has been making, you know, has been been like hugely successful now doing these audiobooks for them largely because they're like yes more battle tech give me more battle tech um because anything battle tech they will yep. take same thing with shadow like run so like world of darkness yes world yes, of yes, darkness yes. is the exact the, same yeah and a lot of the vampire properties are like that in general i think because people are really passionate about that but anyway you please go on but i just wanted to say so you should be doing this when you get good content creators that yep. are willing to work on this stuff i have a couple of properties like this myself that, that in terms of that i would love to be able to play and get into um you know i i've talked about the equalizer franchise i would love to be able to do a freaking 80s spy show set around the equalizer and i think it would be cbs and viacom that has the rights to this please like send some of this my way get someone to make it i will i will feature that i will be 24 7 the equalizer because i love that show and and I think I'll do a good job with it. And I think that Dot would do a great job of this. So sorry, here endeth the lesson. But I want to say that passion is important. They got to grab the passion. And I think that's reflected there. So sorry, you were saying, please. No, I, I, I mean, again, that's all, there's so much hypothetical there, right? Like, sure. because the market, because these kinds of things are dependent upon how, what turn the market takes. Um, uh, for example, we've already got, Already now, can't imagine ten years from now, companies like World of Darkness, right? These these proprietary these companies that own the rights to all this stuff, they're taking one of their pieces of property, Wraith. Mm -hmm. Okay, for those of you that don't know World of Darkness, there are multiple different kinds of monsters in the World of Darkness. Vampires are particularly the most popular, followed by lupine, fae, mages. Mm -hmm. mummies i think are in there somewhere mummies. and then you have you have wraith mummies are terribly scary i think they're like the most powerful thing in the game but you have wraiths um and so there was this giant cry out for wraith to be the next thing because we know they're already developing um 
uh, Lupine um, and Werewolf into into another tabletop. Um, but they're doing it VR. Wraith is going to be a brand new video game release because you play as a Wraith, a ghost. You're in between life and um, life and death. And so they're turning this into this VR experience. And I think when we really look at what Critical Role has done, which is normalize the conversation around a tabletop RPG show in a way that people can actually talk about it and understand it. Um, now we're looking at, okay, how can we do that differently? Like, how cool would it be to play Baldur's Gate VR? First person. <laughs> oh my God, sign me up right now. I, I just played the Final Fantasy VII remake. I premiered um, right? playing it last night. You mentioned doing that VR. But anyway, yes, 100%. But, but it's the like, same thing. And and it's it still has that aspect of tabletop, rolling the dice, that, that piece of, of chance. But VR is something that I don't think we can really ignore. Yeah. And how we can make VR more accessible and integrate it more is definitely something of interest especially if we're talking about a world that's not going back to a level of normalcy right right is i'm there... looking right now at ways to get people to be able to vr and feel like they're sitting in my theater when they're not mm. to see a show because that may be the reality of where we are that's yeah is there before we talk about twitch let me let me ask you yep is there a do you see a potential danger associated? It, well, is there a risk in is there a risk in the um, in this fracturing where we get everybody off in their tiny little fiefdoms, let's say, and we have people who are like like because one of the benefits of something like uh, Fate Core or making Five E part of the OGL, which was very smart and meant they did not make the mistake. Watsi did not make the mistake they made with Four E, where they made it mm -hmm. proprietary, and that was a mess. Right. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a great benefit to that, that you can have systems like Esper Genesis that I play, which is 5e compatible and AIME, which is 5e driven. But is there a danger in the sort of fracturing of, you know, making this particular vampire property be this and, you know, leverage be its own thing, potentially the equalizer be its own thing, Pirates of Darkwater be its own thing, like aliens be its own thing. Is there, is there a danger in subdividing the community such that what you're going to end up with is numbers that are really small in terms of overall interest again well healed but they just they don't want to sort of they can't talk to each other that much you know they don't go to a con that's like this system powered by the apocalypse and then list off like 10 things that we all play that are all based on that system instead it's all just like our own little fiefdoms i'm only i don't know whether i believe that incidentally i'm just wondering if that's a concern that we might or might not have interesting i don't know concern is a strong word I don't know if I have a concern about it. It's definitely something to think about, but I think what that actually does, right, is it's just cutting the pie up into small bite-sized pieces and it allows people to access it easier, right? So for example, my mother, God bless her, has never played a tabletop game in her life, okay? But she's a huge Stargate fan. Hmm. And if I was like, mom, we got to play this game called Cypher. It's totally this thing. And I've built this crazy world where all of this is going on. Da, 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 but it's just a system you've got to learn. Or if I was like, hey, mom, want to play a Stargate game? She doesn't have to know the system right away to know the world. To be able to buy in that fast. Um, I think it's a concern in that gaming companies have to rethink how they sell things to us. Okay. Um, as a consumer, it means we have to consume smaller pieces, which means a lot more of them to get the same slice of pie. Okay. Yep. Um, right. That's, that's a whole different thing. And they can't um, mail it in anymore. You can't just skin it nope. over like, like, nope. okay, Oh look, it's the same people, but it's like another system with the serial numbers right. fall off. Like you've really got to make it match the environment. Right. Basically. But then I think free league's doing some really interesting things, right? They just opened Coriolis up. Mm -hmm. for people to be able to write for it openly they they open sourced it which is very cool because there are you've got 32 freaking star systems connected that's what the third horizon is 32 individual star systems with multiple planets and multiple moons and they're never going to get to all of that in the core books and these 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 modules that they're writing um trust me because i know how long their modules are um they're never going to get to it so they've opened it up for other people to write things. And I think that's when we start to see that collaboration piece again, which okay. oftentimes feels missing mm -hmm. from it. It's like, oh, well, here's a cage around a thing. And it's like, well, it's not really a cage. What it is is a seed. 
And now you can plant a seed, we can plant a seed, you can water it, I can water it, we can add a thing here and make that world bigger and more expansive. Um, and I think that's a very cool, um, yeah, I think it's very neat. Uh, I don't know, it's a neat thing that Free League uh, has there uh, with Coriolis specifically, but um, I don't know. I, I, I don't worry about it becoming, um, I don't worry about it becoming fractured i guess only because i consume games a lot more that way like in how many how many open sourced games do i consume versus how many um very specific games do i consume mm -hmm. things like fate um um well that one's over fate so that doesn't really count does it but like coriolis where it's set in its own world a scum and villainy in its own world fate of cthulhu in its own world mm -hmm. um you know they all use fate which i think is a very helpful thing um and it ties all that together um alien another prime example right mutant year zero another prime example yeah. um world of darkness right vampire the masquerade i play a lot of that um it's it's set in a world this very very particular world and i think as an artist i find it super freeing um i tell people this all the time you hand an artist artist a blank canvas and tons of paint and a couple paint brushes and you're like paint something they are going to freeze right 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 they freeze right, right. but if i was like hey here are four colors two paint brushes and you have 30 minutes to paint something inspired by blah they're going to make a damn masterpiece yep that's right why because sometimes restrictions are actually freeing yep the, knowing the walls frees you that's right creativity comes from constraints it's the reason that sonnets um, are far more inventive than people sometimes give them credit for because correct. of that because uh, we find something in that structure or in that that framework right yeah. that's why a lot of artists don't make it after they get out of art school because somebody stops telling them what to make yeah that's a good point though yeah that's very true um and uh yeah I, I i i agree um okay so let's let's turn this over because and actually it's a good segue because you were talking about your mom and her not playing a tabletop <laughs> game but stargate would be a different matter first of all just let me note you definitely then have to play a one one-on-one -on -one, one shot of some stargate game live on stream with your mom like that just has to happen because clearly <laughs> to out a way to make mom dot come play people stargate will, games. yeah people will flock to see that that would be really great um <laughs> but so but I, but in all seriousness, I mean, I do want to ask then what we think about the future of Twitch, and I want to I want to propose um, two potential paths here, and there's probably more than two, but I just want to propose two potential paths, and then I want to see what you think. I could see two things happening with Twitch as far as tabletop is concerned. The first is that there is a increased commercialization and tendency to aggregate people together into certain types of play and games. So we talk about the critical role effect where lots of people, you get a lot of voice actors or professionals and you go out and you find professionals um, mm -hmm. that are known for other things perhaps or known mm -hmm. for at least acting but not necessarily known for tabletop per se. And you mm -hmm. bring them together and you're like, all right, so we're going to get – you know, uh, uh, Taylor Swift, it turns out, is huge into D&D, &D, and we're going to get her, and we're going to get, like, right. a bunch of other, right, and we're going to, and, and Billie Eilish, and actually, I would, I would I'd pay good money to watch Taylor Swift and Billie Eilish in the same D&D &D game, but anyway, um, so. I just so, pay good money to sit at a table with Billie Eilish, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. I, yeah, I, I like her. Anyway, but, um, you know, so we're going to put them together and just sort of see what happens. So there is a danger of what I would call the celebritization of this where we're going to go down this path of kind of aggregating, combining, and essentially making it into a version of what the music industry became before it, you know, blew I was going to say, this is the flames. film industry. You're talking about the film industry. I know. And, and that's, that's one danger zone is, is that right. Um, publishing, frankly, which is the industry that I'm most involved with is tends to struggle with this because it struggles on the star system. The JK Rowling's of the world fund 92 to 93% of the rest of the authors at that given press. And that's, that's directly true. Star of J.K. Rowling fund the overwhelming majority of the rest of them. This becomes a problem when people like J.K. Rowling turn out to be vaguely trash fires as people and people are like, oh, wait a minute, no, we have to back away. And then, but we can't because the entire right. industry is based on these stars. So there's one, that's, that's one possibility. 
And the, the danger with that is, so that happens, that sort of sucks all the air out of the room and people are focusing on that and Twitch is focusing on that and the sort of where the real good work is being done in the independent things, in the in the sort of the smaller games and not just smaller, but different games, games that are taking more risks, players that are really pushing the envelope more, that are pushing the industry more, that are more representative, frankly, than what you see in some aspects of Critical Role. And I, and I like Critical Role and I like the people involved from what I know of them from a distance I you know I have nothing against them it's just that that's one way of doing it and there is a danger of making that the only way as we've talked about before so there's that for twitch the other way I can see is a system in which more it's it's related to the fragmentation a bit except that what you have is more and more different options for people it becomes essentially like the a la carte um, you know, cable that which later on became streaming service model where I want to get, you know, Disney Plus and I want to get uh, I want to get this uh, these channels because I really like the cooking shows and I want to get this, this and this, but I don't want to get this, this and this. And so people will not flock to commercializations and aggregate channels. They will flock to smaller channels or channels that will be more directly targeted to them. So you'll have people that are like, if you want to watch tabletop that is based upon, you know, uh, dystopian future or near future space uh, type of stuff. So uh, the Prometheus okay. world and the alien stuff and Predator and like that, this is where you go. But if you want to go instead to some place that is dealing with sort of like alternate history, man in the high castle, uh, you know, Nazi <laughs> World War Two type of thing, like that's this is where you go. So I can see it going that direction also where Twitch begins to look more at other other creators besides just the main creators there so and again i know there may be other models but i just want to propose those as two possibilities because we have examples of the first that we just talked about with the music industry i think publishing is affected by this too so i'm curious what you think where we're headed um in terms of the way twitch will affect tabletop play or be affected by it where you see 10 years from now how we're doing stuff online and twitch is just a is just a stand-in right i mean if you think some something else will rise to take its place that's fine but like live streaming i guess tabletop yeah, where are we going, going with anywhere that? yeah right now we're in a satur a saturated market altogether mm -hmm. uh, twitch is heavily saturated part of that is 2020 uh part of that is just this uh, I think it is a rise. Um, we'll see it drop. We'll see 20, maybe 30% of the people currently streaming TTRPGs no longer streaming them at all mm. in 10 years' time. Interesting. Okay. Right? Uh, there's something called burnout. It's going to happen. They're going to find a lot of people that it's not sustainable, um, especially a lot of the small channels. Um, I think we're actually going to start to see some of the small to medium tier combine. Okay. We're going to see them come together to make channels more like hyper RPG. Okay. More like, right? Like, um, there's like a sussing out point, like a shakedown effect that's going to happen. Um, TTRPGs will never disappear entirely, but we are going to see a lot of these like smaller ones just dissipate because mm -hmm. sustainability is how is how business happens y'all um and it, i don't foresee that for a lot of them um the other ones will um i think kind of find this merger i mean even here i am talking to a few of my friends that are each individual streamers but have a lot of talent at the table and we're talking about coming together like what a difference does it make to pass burnout when you start because we've already been doing things together we've already been producing together so why not make that a more permanent thing yeah. How do we make that a more permanent thing and more sustainable for everybody involved? And so those conversations, I know on my end, are already happening. So I think we're going to see that. But I, I would like to think we're actually going to see a lot more experimentation okay. with how we present TTRPGs, right? Because there's only so long that we can stare at faces and boxes. Mm -hmm. There's only so many shows that can set up just like Critical Role at a table together with four or five cams um, before that's not interesting anymore. Mm hmm and so then we start looking at things like hyper RPGs currently doing, where they're kind of pushing the bounds of how we're telling story. They're pre-recording things. They're doing things off-site or on-site, like actually going into the wilderness to add this piece of something here uh, to change the experience there. Um, I will be really interested to see how more people are doing that, right? I make a movie trailer for every one of mine 
games now. Mm -hmm. I just do. I mean, other than drawing people in, like, I think it's fun and it sets the tone and mood. It's why we have trailers for everything else. So as much as I say I'm not, I don't, I'm not really worried about the like celebrity aspect of it because that come that happens in every market we use celebrities to sell things that's what celebrities are for sure that's why we make them sure um and that's never really going to go away we're going to see those celebrity charity games with you know vin diesel and all of these other big named actors who also play ttrpg but what we're going to see for the ttrpg players that are not acclaimed celebrity actors we're either going to see them sink or swim over the next 10 years. Right. Uh, my, my bigger concern is actually, we were just talking about this, Arv, seeing a lot of these gaming companies starting up their own channels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T talk about that, because I think I think that was that was very interesting to me, your take um, on this. So. It's, um, I fear it because it is the end of the individual streamer, right? When, if we look at these, these gaming companies, these publishers, um, and I'll just use Free League as an example. I love Free League stuff. But instead of starting up a channel, why doesn't Free League take that money or that's those startup efforts and go find streamers that are already putting their content out there very, very well yep. and fund them to actually market their stuff, Yep. right? So the example that I gave Arv is like, Coca-Cola doesn't go start its own Twitch channel. Coca-Cola makes sure it puts a Coca-Cola in the right streamer's hands. That's how you sell Coca-Cola. Sure. And, mul Nobody's and, does gonna... the, and does this for multiple streamers. Does this and for, does it for know... multiple streamers. It's yeah. part of a marketing strategy. Yeah. And so I fear with companies like, again, Wizards of the Coast is the anomaly. So I try never to talk about the anomaly. But like, for example, let's look at somebody like Renegade Games. They have their own channel. Cobalt Press has their own channel. And so when you're looking at these, these, these game publishers having their own channel, it's great for them. But it's not great for the market. Right. Um, it's not great for actually growing um, an audience base because, like, Renegade Games. If people love Renegade, they're going to watch that channel. But I have people, for example, on my channel that may not know anything about Renegade. There you go. Right? You go. And then if yeah. I start pimping, what it is is new audience. And so you miss that. Um, you miss that opportunity. And so this is, of course, all of my my thoughts um no right or wrong i guess but i do really fear a lot of these publishing companies starting up their own you know it would be like cnn coming and starting a twitch channel would i like to get my news from x y and z morning show right um you it, it needs the individuality it needs the feeling of 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 what twitch is um to make it work and maybe that shifts maybe it's maybe that is what we see over that 10 year period of time is just a shift in like the gaming companies take over and in the perfect world that also means that they begin actually paying some of these incredible talent outside of celebrities to come sit at a table and play their games and show how they can really be done some justice I, I totally, because that's what's not happening right now i totally agree I, and i the two examples that i want to give to this one example is where i think twitch is starting to do this is with co-streaming certain events and certain circumstances for example the nfl um, the mm -hmm. NFL could very easily create its own Twitch channel and could get a lot of people watching just the NFL. It didn't do that. Instead, it arranged something where Twitch allows you to, a certain number of streamers, to co-stream or restream uh, the particular Thursday night football is what they're yep. starting with. And I watched this out happening on one of the streamers that I often watch. And the interesting thing is, um, first of all, they set it up. It was very smart. They set it up where they had these questions that they basically fed to everyone who's co-streaming it, which is basically, you know, do you think so-and-so is going to score a touchdown on this play? Um, you know, do you think, uh, is it more likely that the Bears are going to get the next score or the, the blah, 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 right? And they just do stuff like this. And then they have a little bit of a competition between each of these streams to see mm -hmm. which one of them, uh, because not only the streamer, but the chat gets to vote on this using a Twitch extension. It's a great idea. But the reason that it also works is it means that you're getting the personality that you want the person mm -hmm. that you already identify with as the person that is actually streaming it so yes the product is there but a lot of these people were people that don't even particularly like what they constantly refer to as sports ball one of my less favorite words um you know like sports ball because they 
they those people are interested because they're like, well, it's kind of a game, and this person that I really like is mm-hmm. streaming it, and so I get to hang out with my people, with my friends and in this community. And watch my favorite show. And yep. watch this stuff. Exactly. Yep. And so, and that's an example of, as you say, putting Coca Cola in the hands of various different streamers rather right. than trying to centralize it. And that, by the way, is not what the NFL usually wanted to do. The NFL has a huge uh, focus on the shield and on their own brand and on having everything but i think it's smart to do it this way because it's not going to diffuse the interest um, among many streamers it's going to make it so that various people various influencers are going to be entry points it's creating more doors through which people can enter so i think the nfl example is an example where twitch could actually do that to go back to something else you said, which is really important too, what I fear about that, because I think you're right, that having all these companies just individually doing this is not the greatest idea for them in the long run, is you run the risk in some of these cases then of making everything be a version of everything else so that it becomes copycat. And the result then is that you lose people who, again, don't fit that same description. So as an example... In our Infinity and Beyond crew, we have two uh, actors to begin with, which is you and Rob, right, who have done this exclusive, you know, we're actors with actors training and, you know, with voice training and whatever. Like, that's that's that crew. And then you have people who are voice actors like Tren, who also yeah. has the voice ability and has done stuff, you know, elsewhere, but is not much of the sort of on-screen kind of film acting yeah. type, right? And then you have people like Saad and John who who are not at all actors. Um, you know, John uh, obviously has an editor and an author background. Right. They're gamers. Uh, they're they're gamers, gamers, right? And Saad, whose day job is as an accountant, right? I mean, like, Saad is not any of these things. But if you lost out on the things that each of these people provide, you lose out on the dynamic that makes Infinity and Beyond what it is. I wouldn't want to have nothing but dots and robs and trends in Lord, my game. if it was in, just dots in and robs, game. we'd never get anywhere. <laughs> It's been, yeah, if we had Rob and you were just cracking each other up, basically Dot and Rob, constantly, would be, we would just feed, it would be a feedback loop from hell. Yes, it would be. We would we would we would currently be level two, and you'd still be in yeah, the second yeah, floor of Death House. Yeah, we'd still be in crust having um, beer, like man. Yeah, it would never get out of it. No, but I mean, I, I think the the benefit of it is that you really get people who are imagining things in different ways, so that Saad, who is a good role player, but he's a role player who comes around to it from a different point of view. Or someone like John, who is himself yep. a different kind of role player and, you know, is the kind of person who I could see might, you know, some people wouldn't know what to make of it and whatever. And just having the personalities combined together creates a much better environment so that you don't see advertisements out go out saying, give me, you know, I'm looking for the six best actors good on camera with the following headshots. And, you know, instead of that, you have a combination of so-called just players, and that's all they've really done to people who have more of an acting background, to even some people, and there, I've seen some of this as well, who had less of a playing background. Rob, for instance, had not played all that much D&D. He hadn't done much of this before. And so Rob was coming from that background of being a performer and an actor and whatever and a voice actor and bringing that into the D&D. So I worry that you lose that. Um, if you start going down this path of yeah. every company starts a channel and every channel has to look like every other channel just with their product. And yeah. and that is risky. I mean, I fear a lot of other things, which is like the fact of the matter is just because you're a gaming company of publisher doesn't make you suited to run a broadcasting station, yeah, well, that's which is basically what true. you're doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, that says something as well. It's like, uh, where you believe you're going to make more money that way, are you actually dumping more money into trying to maintain something that you don't know as well? When you could easily just pass that off, like let word of mouth marketing be what it is, yes. which is organic. Um, and you'll see it a lot. You see it a lot on these mid company. I mean, even some of the recently launched ones, some of these bigger companies, they're launching these channels and they're trying to produce their own content and it's not great. And that's just it. They don't understand casting as Arv pointed out, they don't understand um, a lot of different things. And because usually those gaming companies are seeding people that are part of the creation of the game, I tell people this all the time. If we wanted to watch people in their living room playing, then we would, but we don't. We come to Twitch because there's a different level of production value. We actually want to see a little bit of a performance. We 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 jones for those moments where Rob gets into a monologue Absolutely. and goes down the rabbit hole, right? Absolutely. Like, and that that is not something that everybody can do. And that is a hard pillar to swallow, okay? So 
take it from somebody that has been trying to swallow that pill from acting for years, <laughs> right? There is uh, there is something in, uh, great about having perfect chemistry at a table between a group of people that have a high level of talent. Yeah. And that is not something that a lot of gaming companies are suited to do. Right. I spent years casting things to get to the point where I know exactly who to put at the table together and make incredible chemistry, right? Um, I know and have spent many a year studying the way that stories are structured and telling them and performing them to be able to improvise on the spot things like good strong hands. Right. Um, and that is what gaming companies should want to be paying for. And I'm using me as an example because I learning that I shouldn't use other people always as examples. So I'm trying to use myself uh, as an example, but there are a lot of other talented people that are in the same boat that could bring a lot to a game if they just gave them X amount of dollars versus you spending X amount of dollars to pay somebody extreme amounts of time to run an entire damn channel. Right. I think that's just the, and, and so I, I definitely, um, I go back and forth on it because it's either, I have a feeling it's going to end up flowing heavily one way or the other over the next 10 years. Like the gaming companies will dwindle because they realize they don't have the capacity to maintain a channel themselves right. and that they really need to go with proper branding and um, like influencer based marketing. Um, and then we'll see the rise of like the individual streamers. I think that's true and uh, agreed, Trish. We were talking about that earlier on. Um, and I think you're right about that. Even the ability to assess talent you know i think game masters uh, especially game masters who who run twitch channels and know something about this have a sense of how people are going to work together and what they'll look like on a, in a stream yep. context yep. and um they'll know they'll know enough to know that they can't that they should not just trying to be assemble nothing but actors or whatever um right. or as you as dot says nothing but gamers because you're right because there are, you know, you'll go sometimes and you'll see some of these tiny streams and sometimes these are actually pretty good things and you feel like, why are you not, you know, why are there not more people paying attention to this really cool game that's going on on this channel? And then there's other times where you're like, well, because there's just, it's too much inside baseball. It's too much inside jokey stuff that no one watching is going to understand. Um, or if they understand it, they understand it only because they've been watching from the very beginning. My hope is that the games that people come to on my channel are ones that you pick up in the middle somewhere. If you just show up and you start watching, you go, wow, this is super cool. And I, I love the sort of the characters and the way that they interact with each other. Now I want to go and watch the past ones so I can get caught up. I do not want a system where people come and it's so obscure and opaque because it involves you having this like complicated coding system basically of knowing this person knew this person 50 shows ago, that sort of thing, which I sometimes think is a little bit of an issue with Critical Role, frankly, even. But at least Critical Role, they have such kind of engaging people that that maybe mitigates that a bit. But still, there's a lot of stuff to catch up on. And for a lot of why people, do, they're why like... Why do you think everything I do is four to eight? Four episodes, eight episodes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's only one channel that I do, uh, well, other than yours, that I do more <laughs> than that, right? And it's for, it's, for, it's for people to be able to consume it. That's right. That's right. But I do think that you can create a system where people are where people are able to be interested enough that they'll go back and watch that other stuff without having being shut out. Um, Hope, hopefully, and so, that's the hope, That's right? the hope. Um, but, I, but it's not going to happen for sure if it's something which just requires you to have a bunch of just sort of inside jokes. Also, there are some people that, you know, you'll have conversations with these folks just like privately and you'll make jokes with each other that are off color. And then you'll make jokes with people that are frankly completely inappropriate, even if you're running an adults only type channel that are frankly inappropriate for kind of a larger market or venue or, or broadcast, especially because no one has the context of the person who's saying it mm -hmm. um, when they first come in. And so there's... It's kind of like, yeesh, you know, um, and, and that also is something which then maybe doesn't work as well. So the point is, this is something that streamers are sensitive to, that a lot of companies, especially smaller ones, and most of our industry is made up of the smaller ones. You know, most of our industry, most of the gaming industry, I mean, is made up of a couple of big behemoths and some medium size and a bunch of small indie people. Alligator Alley Entertainment, which does Esper Genesis, is a grand total of five people working on that team. 
Um, and most of these companies, the smaller companies, are small. Um, even the ones that are kind of so-called medium-sized are not enormous. Uh, the crew that had for a while Cubicle 7, that is not an enormous team. You know, that, that's a team that had a 1.10, maybe 12 people on it. And this is the team that had the Warhammer license, the Adventure of Middle Earth license, the Doctor Who license. These are things that you would think like, my God, like these people must be behemoths. They're not. They're not behemoths. So they don't have the ability to run this stuff and they don't have the ability to put it together and you know this is why i think as dot says they need to go reach out to people who love gaming and also know the streamer market so anyway i i yeah so I, it'll be interesting to see i think down the line which direction some of these things are going to go but um i hope that you're right and that the I, I hope that the fear that you have is, is avoided and i hope that we can see them reaching out to streamers and looking for the option to sort of push the envelope because i think it will also help push the industry in a good way as well, not just Twitch, but I think it'll also push the industry because these people will be more of a fan base that will say, hey, this is stuff we'd like to do. For instance, Shadowrun, uh, the, oh God, I get fifth edition or sixth edition, anyway, the latest edition, um, when uh, the folks from, uh, oh gosh, um, no something Tuesday, um, or any given Tuesday. Uh, anyway, I can't... Random I, Tuesday? Random, yes, thank you. You should know this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's random <laughs> I was Tuesday. like, uh, are you talking about Lauren? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was talking about Lauren. Any random Tuesday. But um, so uh, the she was doing um, the Shadowrun latest one, and they ended up stopping streaming it um, because they thought there was serious problems with the QA that was done on it. There were serious problems with sort of the way that the stuff was rendered. Um, and eventually they were just kind of like, uh, this this is not going to work as currently constituted. And I know uh, that the company, the Catalyst, did some work to try to respond to some of that criticism. And part of the reason they could do that is because this wasn't a group that was just designed to go back to Catalyst and say, whatever you say, whatever you say, whatever you say. They weren't beholden to them as much. Mm. And so that meant you could get honest and legitimate feedback on the way that something was playing out, which you wouldn't get in a, let's be fair, in a Catalyst branded channel, you're not going to get honest feedback at that level. It doesn't no. make any sense. I tell so. people, you know what, this is this is that prime example. Um, I Somebody made this example one time to me in my marketing class, and this is so relevant. It was years ago, my teacher. She says, okay, our company makes lipstick. The head of our company, the CEO of our company, is a 60-year-old man. We are not going to put that lipstick on his face and ask him to go pose for Vogue to sell it. We're going to go pay a model to wear that lipstick and to put her face on Vogue. Why? Because he's not going to sell that lipstick. That is what gaming companies are doing. They're taking it themselves and trying to wear their own lipstick. Right. And the fact of the matter is it doesn't look as good. Right. It doesn't look as good as when you go hire somebody that can wear that lipstick better. Yep. That that is meant to wear that lipstick, right? Yep. That's the person that's actually going to be buying that lipstick. Um, and I think that's the exact, it, it's the perfect example of this situation, which is this is the company trying, try, thinking that they're going to make more money that way if we just make sure that our head CEO in a tie wears the lipstick instead. Right. Um, and and there, there has to be recognition that like you're a publisher, they're streamers. You're not a streamer. Yeah, exactly. At least that's how I feel about that, it. That's so. exactly right. Like what you know, getting like Watsi employees, for example, to be doing some of these games. Let's be honest, they did a lot better when they were having Penny Arcade, you know, yep. uh, doing the acquisitions incorporated stuff, um, because there was great chemistry there. And um, you know, the the one exception I can think of to that was having somebody like Chris Perkins um, acting as the DM. But the difference there is that Chris Perkins is arguably, for my money, the best dungeon master currently working. I, I think he is tremendous, and I would put him even above Matt Mercer, as good as Matt Mercer is. And I'm I'm it's one and one a. I mean, like obviously Mercer's great, but uh, Perkins was amazing. And you know, so and he happens to be the guy who was a big content driver um, for WotC, and you know, so that was unusual. Um, but he also was a huge D and D fanatic, as you might expect, and like runs four games every week in addition to his day job. So I mean, you, Chris is a little bit of a freak of nature. Um, but most of the time, there were other cases, and I saw some of these. Uh, there were some streams that they were like getting some other employees, and they're like, "Oh, you know, here's the head of QA, and here's the head of this," and I'm like, "That's really boring." Um, because they're just not that thing. And it doesn't mean 
they, they probably are very good in certain cases at QA and very good at this thing that they do. That doesn't mean because they know the game really well that they can sell it and, as Dot says, wear the lipstick. So yeah. it's, it's you know, you I mean, they really, can wear it. It just doesn't, it just doesn't look good. probably look as good, and you that, know? <laughs> and that requires talent assessment, and it requires knowing how people will work together. And I think that puts the onus on having good DMs and GMs and, as you say, yeah. production values um, that are able to kind yeah. of be rendered this way. I mean, people ask all the time, like, oh, you're such a good RPer. How did you learn to do that? I was like, y'all, I'm a performer. Yeah. I'm a performer. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I've, I've been performing long before I was rolling dice. I was performing. Like, I'm a performer. I live for this shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, this yeah. is what I do. This I perform. Um, and I just happen to also really love games. And so because of that, I can merge the two. But, like, again, it's there is something to be said for the right talent. You're right, Arf. Yeah. So, um... All right, well, cool. Well, as, as always, really cool aspects of this discussion. Um, let us talk a little bit about uh, the game that we've been thinking about. And chat, you're going to get a chance to uh, weigh in with questions in a little bit. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about uh, a product of some kind that over the last month-ish or so, um, we have been interested in and have been okay. sort of looking into. Um, do you have one? If not, I... Think well, I I've been doing, um, I've been doing, you know, I've been really diving into this alien RPG. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of mechanics about the game that I really, really like, specifically for a horror RPG. You know, mm -hmm. it's like horror is hard um, to really like do, especially when you're in an RPG. Um, so there's that. But I am, um, Monday, I uh, am getting to play test a new Thirsty Sword Lesbians RPG that just hit Kickstarter that's been doing very, very well. So I've been, uh, that's been a mood and a half to like simmer in for the last few days as I prep that prep that out. So that's kind of fun and kind of cool. Um, but yeah, this Aliens game is really, really neat. Uh, it's a die pool system. Pretty, pretty normal, except because it's horror, um, they have a, a stress bar. Like stress is something that you take. So if you undergo some kind of stressful environment, you see a dead body for the first time or a xenomorph for the first time, something that you can't explain. If your scientist fails his like sciency role, like there's a there's a list of things that cause stress. And every box that you tick on your stress track adds another die to your pool, which means the more stressed you get, the more likely you are to succeed. But it's also, if you fail on one of your your uh, your stress die, you panic. And then there's like a roll you make off of a panic table, just like you would say. So my dice pool can start to get huge, which means I could start succeeding so much. I could do so much succeeding, but it also means my likelihood of failure is much, much higher. Yeah. And so this aspect of gameplay between your character getting more and more stressed and being like, yeah, yeah, I'll push the die. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'll reroll those. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you start rerolling and then the panic sets in and that panic could make you freeze. That panic could uh, make you lash out at another PC um, unwillingly. Uh, it could, um, for example, one of the best moments of panic from the last Aliens game was um, they decided to mutiny, basically, because they figured out that there were xenomorphs on board and they're like, we're taking control of the situation. Is, is this um, the poor Zach thing I keep seeing? Is this um, like tied into the... No, no. Okay. Well, poor Zach. That's a whole, it's a whole other thing. This okay. is, this is actually the doctor. Uh, okay. Cause that was on a panic die. Okay. Zach's situation was not, but yes, poor Zach. He's the kid who's witnessing all of this basically. Okay. Okay. Um, so our scientist picks up the commando's gun and like, you know, begins pointing it around, swinging it around like all good scientists do. And he rolled and rolled a panic roll and uh, rolled uh rolled a stress die it failed therefore he had to roll panic he rolled okay. for panic and his panic number put him on um twitchy uh a twitchy finger twitchy something and so i was like this is perfect he's totally going to misfire in his panic he was just like gah, 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 and just like misfired this weapon across and killed a commando accidentally right but that was all based on the die because he panicked and then it just so happened that his panic roll was like absolutely perfect it was the, it was the absolute perfect moment um for that like and, and then everybody ha all of them have to take a stress die because he just misfired a weapon so it's like this the scene is constantly like upping itself to the point where like stress becomes something you actually have to start mitigating um and it's it's such a neat mechanism for horror because it it really puts you in that mindset 
of like how much stress do I have? Can I even should I even roll this? Because what if I fail? You know what I mean? Right. Um, that's a lot right. of stress die. Right. Um, so there's some really neat mechanisms that happen there uh, that I think um, I'm just really enjoying in the game. And then of course for me, just the game itself because I'm a like alien junkie um, is pretty is pretty spectacular. Um, I found out that the guy that helped write the book was actually one of the original writers on all of the movies. Oh, so he's that's like cool. deeply embedded in the lore, and so there was, um, you can tell, you can like totally tell. Um, I've been doing really neat things for Mike's Patreon. Like, um, there was a piece from the Alien book, much like World of Darkness, that you'll be like flipping through, and then you'll find these like first person accounts where mm -hmm. people write things and so that kind of stuff. And so I don't know if it's a first person account as much as more like a confidential file is kind of how it reads, like you're reading a confidential file, but, um. It kind of walks through the first two movies into the third film about like what happened after the third movie, mm -hmm. after the single survivor. Um, and that the first time I read it is actually what inspired this entire campaign. So I went back and like read the confidential file um, into an audio for everybody to like hear and listen to. But I think that's I'm just really loving Again, I'm, I'm a, an alien junkie, but I'm really loving it because it feels right for the world. Um, as a GM, it feels like I can tell that kind of alien story based mm -hmm. on the way the mechanics play out. Um, and then kudos to like my cast, who is just amazing. Yeah, they're like um, right on. Well, just, but kudos just, to you for casting them. I mean, you yeah, know. well, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's <laughs> that's done. um, yeah, that's been pretty cool. So yeah, I, I think that's the one I'm going to hype on right now. Um, I haven't actually cracked uh, too deep into. Um, Thirsty Sword Lesbians, but it's a, it's a very neat game, um, and I'm very excited to play it on Monday, so I'm going to have to report on that one later. It's going to be cool stuff. I'm looking, actually, at the uh, Swords Cross and Hearts Race and all this from the uh, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the Swords Cross, Hearts Race. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, you know, things like uh, you fight with flirt, and you fight with, like, all kinds of things other than just your sword, and it's like, it's very thirsty. It is very thirsty. That is pretty sweet. Um, um, it's very thirsty. So it's, it's definitely a setting. I've been trying to figure out... It's it's October, so I feel like I should put them in like a Halloween scenario. But I'm trying to think of the most lesbian Halloween scenario that I can, like roller derby, or yes. something like that. Yes. Um, you know what I mean? Like I I need like something where they're allowed to get like thirsty and angry. Um, like I need I've got to find their like is... a roller derby. I think is where it's gonna happen. Oh yeah, um, that's that's. So. <laughs> That's funny. And, you know, Critch, which I think what you say there is right, which is that it's totally in theme for the franchise. I, I think this is also important in that I can imagine if, if you, in a heroic fantasy setting, set up an environment where everyone is stressing everybody out, and there, there, I can imagine that going south very quickly, because it's mm -hmm. not what's expected, right? The idea is that you're expected to come out of it somehow and work together to some common purpose or whatever, rise above the level. Um, but that's not what happens in horror games. And we've experienced this a little bit, even in Curse of Strahd, where there has definitely been a fair bit of uh, people being, you know, ticked off at each other for a while and not trusting each other and worried about, you know, can I believe that you were going to do X, Y, Z and all this stuff, um, because that's the sort of setup of it. And the benefit of that, if you explain it well enough, and this is the key, being able to make sure that you've had these discussions, we've talked about this many times, not just session zero, but the expectations for that campaign. Um, mm -hmm. That means that they expect this stuff. So the fact that, you know, poor Zach, because he's this kid playing this kid watching all of this, he absolutely knew that was going to happen going into this, yeah. right? Everybody yes. absolutely knows the chance of misfiring, that it's going to stress everybody out. And you go with it because the whole point is you're investing yourself in this world right. where horror is a component lean of the universe. In, lean in. You lean into it, yeah. And, and I think... That is something sometimes I think, again, be careful not to take the assumptions of the sort of default setting and then impose that upon something which doesn't allow it. Don't go, oh, my God, but if I do this, they're going to get really pissed off because it's they're not going to min-max their... They're playing a horror game, so it's about the notion that they're underdogs. It's about the notion that they're in big trouble. It's about the notion that, oh my god, we're always... If you're playing a thriller game, don't be worried if you have these people on a breakneck pace, because it's a thriller, and you're supposed to have them kind of moving along. On the other hand, if you're playing I'm also, a... I'm also... 
yeah. you know, just to finish up, you're playing a Regency romance, um, then yeah. probably not a good idea to be doing that. But then don't be afraid of long dialogues with the equivalent of Darcy and, uh, you know, and, and um, Elizabeth sort of staring each, at each other right. and going like, you know, this, like as the rain pours down, like that's what it's about, man. <laughs> like you, you want that stuff there. So knowing yeah. the sort of parameters and establishing those for your players is important. You were going to say. Uh, that I that's exactly true. Like I told them, I was like, your first character is probably going to die. You need a second character. So we're building two teams, and so I'm actually telling the story via two groups of people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we've gotten the like mining colony group. Uh, starting next week, we get to see two episodes with the space trucker crew. Which uh, spoiler alert for anybody that's in chat that's been watching it: the space trucker crew is the same crew that crashed that the mining colony finds. We're actually jumping back 10 years in time and nobody really knows it yet. Um, so like the mining crew found this rig, this this ship that crash landed, which has the alien and stuff on it. We're going back to find out about how that space cr trucker crew crashed with the alien on board. So it's the it's a prequel almost. Uh, it's a prequel, so yeah. So we, we set it up, they found it, there's been drama, the first alien's been released. Now we're going back to find out how and where we got the alien. Um, like, how did it get on board the ship? Why did this uh, ship crash land on this planet 10 years earlier and nobody really knew about it? And then the last two episodes, they're all in the same place now. So as pe characters begin dying, the next one can just, like, come out of cryo and be there to continue. So there's this expectation that at least one of your characters is probably, if not both of them, will die. And it's the same actors, right? So our same players. Mm -hmm. On it's just two different sets of characters. Okay, that's that's I see. That's yeah, that's really cool. I didn't actually know that. I was thinking it was two separate groups of players. That's really no. It's cool. the same. It's the same that's group. Really so they're cool. going to be playing truckers next week, and then you know the Super idea cool. is when their first group dies, the truckers are going to kind of come out of cryo because they've been. Uh, in cryo sleep uh, and they crash landed um and they did they were very smart last week and did not they did not start thawing those cryo tubes so we'll see um how it pans out for them yeah that's super cool yeah. i'm i'm interested yeah. in that so all right so let us um as uh, dot said let us let us talk a little bit about questions here so chat here is your chance um to ask questions of dot or myself um both of us uh and you can do that just with please capital question so put all question in all caps for me and then colon and then what question you would like to ask us about anything relating to tabletop if we talked about stuff that you want to follow up on today now is the chance um to do that if you're having something in your own particular campaigns or if you're like hey i want to try this game i don't know if i should i have this tabletop situation what do i do um that's the kind of stuff uh that you can ask us right now so Please jump in. Let us know what you think in terms of questions that you would like to ask us uh, as we move towards the end of today's episode. What would you like to ask Dot or myself or both for yeah. us to chat about questions about aliens, about, you know, very the yeah, equalizer. I'm so excited. I, I have to show you. So there's this. OK. I, I'm going to just share a clip because it's one of my favorite bub moments ever. Okay. Um, and of course, I get to play the Wayland Utani representative who's the smarmy, like, total tie, you know, like, clip on tie asshole. Okay. And there is this fantastic moment with bub. Let me see if I can find it. Where this is the mutiny moment. This is the moment where they all start the process of mutiny. And, uh,. I think this is i think this is the one okay just for just for funsies if you don't have questions you can watch that instead ben reacts it's brilliant i almost i couldn't handle it um just watch the whole clip enjoy yourself <laughs> let's see oh all right this is a 49 let's see uh let me it does have language is it okay um to you, do you mind if i just put this on like can i sure can i okay yeah i think that's great all right so give me a second chat oops studio mode first just in case i were to stream something i wouldn't want to that would be <laughs> listen to dot and me talk you know wax poetic about the importance of pro streamers doing stuff like this and then be like whoops i accidentally broadcast my social security number um <laughs> all right here we go so let's put this down oh, here on stream and then i see that long. question we'll talk about that in a sec trish <laughs> um it's alrighty. so freaking ridiculous okay here we go out of 
out of like fear, frustration, and stress. Oops, sorry. Can I, oh, can yes. I, can I react okay. like out of, out of like fear, frustration, and stress? Yes. Um, you sure can. I would say your turn of like being frozen while this thing scuttered off is long gone. I, uh, I want to move up behind the guard. Yeah. Um, the one guard down here with, uh, with the rifle. And I want to put the Watatsumi up against his back. The okay. bolt gun. The bolt gun. Uh, yeah, he's still, this commando's kind of shaking, and he, he's overbite near the elevator, and so we'll say you kind of sneak around, and you stick it up next to his back. Um, he goes, oh, oh. All sweaty and, like, shaky. Oh. Drop the fucking gun, guy, because this will punch through your armor, and will hit Doug oh. right in the back. Uh, Doug, 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 uh, Doug looks over, and he goes, hey, you, you can't pull a gun on security? Eat my cock, Doug, I don't care! <laughs> Oh man. Okay. And then they were just like I just almost died. There that point because they were all because it it was that moment where the crew tips like they're like we have to take it it's that perfect alien moment where like they have to take matters into their own hands or they're all going to die. Because mm -hmm. here's Doug, which uh thanks to chat has been named Doug Dimadome. Doug Dimadome uh working for Wayland Utani. Um was trying to move these bodies in this this cargo that they found that had long been lost back up which they all know does not need to go back up there because it's full of fucking aliens right and so the crew is like we're not moving that and doug is like i'm pulling rank and yes you are and so they just were like nope <laughs> so flip and it's that great it was i did not set that up all i did was push them to the edge and then my players chose to do the mutiny mm -hmm. and it was just a really it was a really great moment but um the, the genuineness of what it is to be human in a moment of terror where where the roughneck looks at the clip on tie guy and goes shut the fuck up <laughs> we don't care anymore you know like that that's so genuine and honest and really um just pushes that that horror like aspect of what we're trying to do i just i that clip in particular. yeah that's There's a great. whole bunch of clips from that show you should go watch but that one in particular that one really got me it requires um, also the players to really understand the characters so that they can play them consistently trending is very good at this uh trend is very good at mm -hmm. understanding his character at uh and all of you are including you dot but i meant i just off the top of my head as i was thinking about it trend mm -hmm. is so good at being able to understand this is what would my character would be driven by but the difference between that and someone who's obnoxious that says it's all that matters is what my character thinks is that the character recognizes that being a rational, sane character, that he lives in the world with other people. But there are some times where you're going to push his buttons on particular individual subjects where he's just like, I don't give a good goddamn about any of this. So like, you know, the werewolves is a good example. You know, you run into werewolves and given Weller's own personal experience and what was done, you know, to his best friend and all that, his hatred for lycanthropes and in particular werewolves is so deep that if you put him in a position where he's going to get a chance to punish them, he is going to do so with great prejudice. Like, you know, there's there's none of this, like, I, I well, let me kind of min-max and, you know, metagame the situation. Like, he just doesn't do right. that. So um, it, it's not always easy to do that because there are players like that who are obnoxious, but then there are players who are team players but still really understand the root of their character yep. so that they'll yep. operate even out of stress, you know, because they realize that's what their character would do. And there's right, a, there's a trust factor, too, by the way, that they do that yep. and they know that that's not like... Because the DM and the GM is not trying to... I, I win now, right? Like that's right. dissent that there are other games like that where the overlordish character is trying to beat the players. It's not a game that I particularly care for. Um, the games that are most interesting are the ones where the GM or DM is refereeing, is putting the story and the yes. world in front, but is not like, yes, I win and you lose. Like that, that. Right. Like there was it's this not whole about thing that, early so. on when we got a bunch of corruption bars filled. Everybody's like, give them aliens. And I was like, y'all, we're one hour into this. There's not even, nobody's even had an alien put in a body yet. Like, there's not even been a face hugger. I can't just make an alien appear. Like, the story is going to mitigate some normal levels of, of, of like, bad things happening. How long does it um, even take know? in the movie for the alien to appear? I mean, the whole point is it takes forever yeah. before you get to the point because they're every building it up, one of right? them is Every one of them is built that way. Even, even Prometheus and Covenant have this idea of, like, we're dealing... We're going to set these humans up to deal with normal horror, right? My ship exploding and uh, leaving me on this planet. Um, 
somebody's sick um the satellite is broken right like there has to be this normal level of bad thing that happens in space that they attempt to overcome to set a standard for what they think is bad and then the alien shows up like right. every movie is set up that way right. so that when the alien right. gets there that normal ass human shit doesn't mean anything yep. because you are faced with your actual demise yep and, and so yeah yeah, that's absolutely right. Good example. Another good example of that out of the Alien franchise, moving away from that for a second, is uh, the movie The Abyss, um, in yes. which there are all kinds of individual problems and things that exist. And then also there are the creatures that they find, you know, at the bottom of the ocean. And then also there's the nuclear weapon that they have to defuse yeah. and like all of these different things um, mm -hmm. that are sort of set against the backdrop of this. Um, so you, you create a problem and then you make it worse by adding another problem. Um, and how right. do those things kind of function together? So we did get one question there, which uh, from um, from Trish. So I'm going to back up there. Nope, nope, not there. There we go. What I wonder about most is how you all find the energy and time to do all these things. How do you stay creative instead of burning out? Um, well, sleep is not necessary. No, um, that's, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, I will, I will answer myself and then I'm interested to hear what Dot has to say about it. Um, it is not easy um, to find energy and time to do everything. Um, but there are two things that help. The first is to make sure that you also lean on other people so that you're not having to force feed or kind of drag along a particular thing, especially important in tabletop. Um, the kiss of death on Twitch would be to watch a game where the dungeon master is just like, okay, so what do you do? So what do you meant, right? Um, that's like pushing, like pulling things along um, like that is absolutely the kiss of death because it means that at best, what you're going to get is people going, oh, so-and-so is really trying hard. But that's not an enjoyable experience, right? It's an, not an enjoyable experience to watch one person, like, you know, rolling the Sisyphean boulder up the hill and praying it's not going to slip and slide all the way back down the hill again, right? That's not exciting to anybody. They just feel bad or something like that for the DM or GM. Um, and also, the whole point of it is the variety and the excitement and the dynamism of having everyone work together. So one thing is making sure that you have players that are really kind of helping move things along. The second thing in a broader sense, too, is the idea of patterns. Um, I'm a very big fan of identifying patterns in one's own interests. So in my case, um, I, like Dot, likes to talk about herself as a storyteller. I view myself as valuing community, communication, and compassion as the three main things that kind of underpin my life. Those are the most important values I think that I possess. And uh, storytelling is an enormous component that to me unites those things. It brings us together in community to uh, listen together to a well-communicated story that is driven fundamentally by compassion. Um, even sad stories to me are driven fundamentally by compassion. Our compassion for those that we lose, our excitement and compassion for those that succeed, the bittersweet qualities of those that partially win and partially lose, and those are the best stories, I think. Um, but those three components are part and parcel of everything I do. They are a part of my writing. They are a fundamental part of my teaching. They are frankly a part of my, I hope, raising my children. They are a part of every aspect of what I do. And so those patterns, when I was in public speaking and I was doing debate at a high level, the way that you respond to arguments is not by thinking, oh, I've never heard that argument before. Because you would, you would get crushed. Like people, you know, constitutional law scholars putting together seven minute cases that you've never heard of and then you have to get up immediately after the conclusion of the case and mounted opposition is impossible if I were basing this on, you know, some kind of overall knowledge of that particular individual thing. It worked because I could identify patterns, because I understood that basically this argument could be grouped under the idea of this, this, and this. And that is what storytelling is. There are only so many different kinds of story types or qualities, right? And so grouping them together is the way it works. Yep. And so for me, it's working on patterns. So, Dot, what do you, what about for you? keeps you from burning out in this uh in this space the, um, and keeping the energy the sad fact is <laughs> i haven't i'm burned out and like <laughs> the sad fact is saying no is important and knowing what kind of stories you want to tell and i think that's what i kind of took away from what arv is saying right like <clears throat> uh I'm very particular about what tables i play at now because i don't like to carry a table um, which is hard. Yeah. Um, for a while, I got invited to a lot of tables where I just carried the table, and that's work. Um, I and it, it didn't feel fun. 
Um, just like Arv has this kind of set of values that he lives by, one of mine is joy. And I want to be at a table that is full of joy. I want to be at a table where I can bring joy. I want to be at a table where we can give joy. Um, and if I'm not having fun, then I don't need to be there. And that was very hard early on because I felt like I should I should bring joy to everybody's table. And the fact of the matter is you're not going to be right for everybody's table. Every game right. is not going to be right for you. And so I started saying no to a lot of things, which was very hard um, for a lot of people to hear. Even now, people ask me to do stuff and I have to say no, I can't because I'm only one human. Um, but I play less and less now. Um as a player i gm about as much as i play um right now i'm in three campaigns that's right three well how about this i'm under three gms arb is one of them trooper sjp is the other and mathis games is my third um and i trust each of those humans exponentially for different reasons in terms of how they do storytelling and um so i'm very particular about my gms um, but as a GM, I want to be telling stories that get me jonesed. Far, for far too long did I trudge through trying to run a D&D &D game on somebody's channel that I wasn't inspired by or a um, module that I felt like I needed to do because I was told this is what everybody wanted to focus on. Yeah. When I opened up and started saying, what games do you want to play? What games get you hyped? Like hyped, right? Overlight was one of them. that got me hyped. Yeah. Uh, Coriolis got me hyped aliens got me hyped yep. and what i find is when i get hyped about things success however you define it at least the success levels for me were there and yep. were met yep um and on on plays i could have never imagined right this coriolis campaign was not supposed to be going on a third season but here we are and it's something that I very much look forward to. The story that we have all created together inspires me. It brings me joy to sit down at that table. It yep. doesn't take it from me. Yep. Um, and that's that's another key thing. It's like you have to find the things that bring you joy and you have to play. If I'm going to play, I have to play under people that allow me to have that joy. Um, I mean, shit, I'm doing two games with Mathis right now because I love him so much. Like, I got one game out of him was like, that's not enough. I need another. And then I launched a podcast, right? So, like... Um, I'm, I'm super duper particular, um, in that regard. Um, yeah, I'm super particular in that regard. That's all I guess I can say to that. Um, so yeah. And I'm all about giving people a chance, but like, I, like you said, I'm only one human and there was a period of time where I was playing, I was trying to play in everybody's games. Like I wanted to give everybody my time and my energy and it did suck me dry. It yep. left me like empty and tired. And I was like, okay, I have to go back to the drawing board. Why do I feel this way? Um, and it's because I wasn't, I wasn't telling stories that I wanted to tell. I was telling everybody else's stories, which is exactly why I left theater. Yeah, like that's proper, actually, right? that's true. You want it right. You want to be able to tell the stories. I that wanted, I'm, I wanted some yeah. autonomy and, and the story process, which theater wasn't allowing me. And when I'm sitting at a table where I'm not feeling, maybe it's not autonomy so much at that point, as much as I'm just not feeling the story, right. like I'm not buying into it, which is not helping anybody else at the table um, and so forth and so on. And so just being a little bit more particular about what I play and why I play it. Um, there's a lot of games out there and a lot of them just aren't for me. Right. And I they think, just aren't. <laughs> and I think, and I think it's important to recognize that in in most cases, not all, there are some cases where you do and should make value judgments about a particular game because it's, you know, misogynist or or racist or something terrible. But a lot of the time, I think um, it, the fact that a game is not for you does not make it a bad game. It makes it not a game for you. Um, and that I think is you're right. Understanding who you are as a player and so forth becomes really important. And just to quickly add to what Critchwitch said. It, Dot's 100% right that the hype, it, it does, that part can flow from the top because even players will <coughs> pick up on the enthusiasm of a game master. And again, enthusiasm is not the same thing <laughs> as forced compliance, okay? I want to say that very clearly. I say, you know that, what I just heard? You know, saying to somebody, like, you have to do this because if you don't do that, like, it's very obvious that some people are going to be like, yeah, I'm not really on board with X, Y, Z. 
I was interested in running Curse of Strahd because, as I've said before, I wanted to challenge myself and I wanted something which were the IAB regulars would be kind of a palate cleanser, would be something that would, more than a palate cleanser, something that would be a very different feeling kind of campaign from the heroic fantasy one that we just left behind. Um, and everyone really bought into that because they liked the idea of trying something different for a little while. And the next one we do after this is going to, again, be very different from these ones that we did previously. So, um, but that's important to recognize that you were enthusiastic about it. When we do the Eberron stuff, man, I am I am pumped up for Eberron because I love the Eberron world. Um, and I love conceptually a lot of what Eberron does. And so I'm very excited to play that. And that enthusiasm will just, for everybody, provide a lot better options uh, for everyone to be able to role play within that. And so getting hyped for, yeah, exactly. Getting hyped for your players really matters as well. Um, so Rising Tides also had one question for us. We'll probably take, this will be our last one. Maybe one more if someone has an awesome quick one. But otherwise, Rising Tides asked question, if permissions, etc., were not an issue, would either of you ever consider a live stream campaign with teenage players? Assuming permissions were not an issue, 100%. And that's because I teach this age group all the time. So I have no problem whatsoever with doing it. And in fact, I think that it, there's some value to that as long as you can make sure that what you're doing is not exploitative, it obviously depends on the group and how you're positioning it, but I think it would be valuable to see that and also empowering for those who play as part of it. Zach um, Clay, who's in you know my campaign and the uh, vocalist and is on Dot's campaign, um, Zach uh, has for a long time, a number of years actually, run a D&D club where he does this for actually middle schoolers, even, even younger really. Um, and he, he gets a great joy out of that, partially because they commit themselves to it, which is really great to see, but partly because it is shaping their experience because study after study after study has shown that people who have a positive role-playing experience of that kind find better educational outcomes and even better life outcomes. It's not hyperbolic. They learn to work better in groups. They learn to overcome uh, obstacles. They learn that when bad things happen that were not under their control directly, that that is something they can recover from. And that, folks, is the experience of life experiencing things that we don't have under our direct control. And the question is not what we experience, but how we respond to what we experience. Um, and so, yes, I 100% I would do that. Again, assuming permissions and all that was not a I concern. Say, my question is, why does it need to be live streamed? That's well, my that's, question always to people. That's it's like, fair. If you're just talking about TTRPG with, with teenagers, absolutely. I've already done, like I did that when I was, when I was a vice principal at a high school, we had a gaming club and we, I did that. Um, I ran them with, with students that desperately needed to play role-playing games. And it was really, really wonderful for them. My question is why live stream? Like, what is it that live stream is adding to the experience? What about representation? Because kids don't think, if kids only think that only adults play this stuff and they can which is, see. Which again, is know. a great reason. It's like, okay, now we're talking representation. So we need to choose a game that's right I'm for the I'm just wondering, group. I'm speculating. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think it's a great point. Like I said, like I didn't have an answer to that. I, that's my big thing is like, okay, there are a lot of hurdles to jump through when you put teenagers under that kind of pressure to live stream. Yeah. Um, and it, some of them can be really good and some of them can be really bad. Um, and I wonder if like, if it being a live stream makes a difference in what we, what we are trying to achieve. Now, if it's this true. case is just representation, showing a younger age group playing through a game that adults can also play, like making it clear that it's accessible to a younger audience. Is with a mutual great... care for each other, with mutual support, with adults treating them seriously, with them having a safe space, you know, that sort yeah. of thing, right? Like that Yeah, absolutely. Of... And I think that's all interesting. Um, I go back and forth on, I mean, would it work? Absolutely. Should it happen? Totally. Um, for somebody who wants to take that up, Dot is not that person. I have spent far too long with them. Um, <laughs> I used to deal with discipline with them. Hard pass. Yeah, yeah. Hard pass on teenagers. I don't understand them. I barely understand <laughs> my current, like I'm definitely was born in the wrong decade. Um, and I just, yeah. So. <laughs> That's funny. Um, you know, well, listen, uh, do you just role play, uh, you know, as a vice principal, uh, the breakfast club, like, what was it like for you? <laughs> we, I play that game on my channel, though. I do it with adults, not kids. So uh, well, that's what it's I was saying. Like, it's called breakfast cult. Yeah. Uh, and it's a uh, Cthulhu. That's what they do. They, they play, um, they play like teens at a, at a, at a, uh, a cult high school, um, 
called a Coltar Academy and they all have detention. Like every one shot is yeah, like yeah, them. Yeah. They're, they have a Sunday detention and it's the shenanigans they get into in this occult high school on I detention just, day. I just know a bunch of vice principals and I was just thinking about the, uh, the, the, qu- the kind of sort of things that would be represented in those. Yeah. No, I, I get on. it. I get it. Um, uh, never, never again. School administration. Not for me. <laughs> not my thing. Not my oh, thing. Man. Um, so a bunch of 30 plus playing teens really is the perfect breakfast. Club. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, and, you know, as folks know, my Tales and Tomes from the Forbidden Library is inspired by the Breakfast Club um, and was the direct inspiration for it in some ways, especially the first part of it. So anyway, um, so and I agree, Eberron is awesome and I I can't can't wait to be able to get that. Dragospear, what do I like most about Farscape? What do we like most? I mean, listen, um, you know, great puppets, uh, great characters. I was about to say, practical effects, puppets. Um, The uh, the first time I had really taken an organic vessel into like, uh, as as a character, which I think is, is super duper important there's a high level of mysticism in farscape that oftentimes gets overlooked in sci-fi which Agree. i really really liked very good um, character building for sure very good yeah very good character building and and the you know i think that there's something to be said for john Crichton's like mental degradation yes of being of being lost to space and having to deal with your own humanity of being the last of your kind because you're not with your people and you're not going to get back to your people like there's something there's something in that that i found really intriguing um there's so oh there's so much about farscape that i love but that's just some i would i would say that's true i do think i think that farscape suffered a bit i think farscape got so weird that there was a point at some point where i was kind of like I felt very unmoored. Um, and, I, you know, this this is something similar which happened in a much shorter period of time with the incredible BBC show The Prisoner, um, which at a certain point got so bizarre that everyone was just like, what the hell are we even doing? Like, maybe, you know, if I – maybe if I were I spending more that. time, you know – on some form of LSD, I, I, that might have been helpful. I would have gotten it more, but like there were parts of it that I'm just like, as much as I love the prisoner, I'm like, well, right. Um, and you know, the alien you know. sadist in your head. No sure. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Know? Yeah. Scorpius. I, mean, is like, I, I think like, a lot yeah. of people felt like that uh, with Babylon Five that it got a little too dark, and like once it got to a point, it was almost too weird to like right. accept um, or to like be believable in some way, even though you're talking about like aliens and space and stuff that like we can't even totally prove ourselves. But yes, um, doesn't matter. I loved yeah. it anyways. The the struggle of John Crichton to maintain his sanity is su- something that really resonates even now um, with me. But I also really like, I'm like, let's push that envelope, right? Mm-hmm. Twin Peaks, bring it on. Like, oh man, that the newest, I don't know if anybody's a Twin Peaks fan. Spoiler alert, uh, I am. Uh, the newest season that came out, the one that came out like two or three, four years ago, uh, that was like the third one. Yes, season three. Mm-hmm. Um, they had an entire episode that is just this like, I don't want to call it a NASA trip. That's, that's not it. It's like a disassociative episode. Right. Where it's just like images and colors and sound. And like you're watching it. And you're like, I think I understand what's going on, but I don't think I get what's actually going on. And you're like, <laughs> you're trying to piece a narrative together when there's nothing actually being said. And so I'm I'm here for that kind of stuff. I'm like, let's push the envelope. Right. Um, but, but what was crazy when I came out of that episode, I was like, I think I understood it everything that just happened and that's how you know it was really fucking good storytelling because here you are watching a disassociative episode of just like images and colors and these kinds of things and then you get to the end and you think you actually put it together you think you actually understood what was going on and you're like how did i do that how did how did they make me do that because that's really what it is um it's yeah it's it's very much it's it's the idea of having to kind of surrender yourself to the sort of circumstances and move forward with it like yep uh, you know, like the like the Numenera stuff, frankly, like a lot yep. of Monty Cook stuff sort of relies on you just putting aside your, but wait, this doesn't make sense. You just kind of have to go yep. with it. Like if you play yep, Planescape Torment and expect, as a video game, for instance, and expect like, let me figure out how X leads to Y. Uh, it's just, it just doesn't work that way. There's a kind of organic sense to it if you just allow yourself to embrace it. And so that's, that's part of what Farscape is. And again, and that's not going to work for everyone. And I, I want to reemphasize that's mm-hmm. not going to work for everyone. That doesn't make those people wrong. And nope. it doesn't make, you know, you sort of superior to them because you're able to understand what they don't understand. As long as they don't come after you and be like, listen, that show's garbage because it doesn't make any sense. That That's on them. But it's not on the reverse to sort of be like, look down at people that don't 
click with a particular show and go, listen, you people don't really, that that's no, I mean, that's not the case. There are some shows that don't work for people and that doesn't make them dumb or bad people or, you know, whatever else. Um, it, it just mm -hmm. depends on the nature of the person in question. So, um, so all of that, um, yeah, 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 exactly. Seeing it is a big part of this. It's true. Rising tide. So, um, all right. Well, folks, this has been awesome. Um, but I need to let dot go sadly. Uh, and we need to uh, get ready to move on here to some D and D with viewers. Um, so I want to ask, uh, dot again, we will hopefully have, have dot back in the future, but she's going to be stepping away for a while now, um, to attend to things of her own. So first, let me thank you dot for having been a wonderful co-host on this. And I hope uh, to have you back in the future. In the meantime, besides our vocalist and of course, Chris Estrada at the end of the month, but besides that, where, where do you want to kind of highlight people be looking for you, yeah, um, yeah. at these places? Um, right now, my big project is, um, Pod by Night or Stitch of Fate, which is the Vampire the Masquerade podcast that I um, have put together with some friends. Um, we're up for six nomina uh, six nominations with the Audioverse Awards, so go vote for us. That'd be super chill. Every time you see Stitch of Fate, just click that box. Um, both myself is up for a performance award along with like um, our audio editing and um, Mathis as a GM and all of our players. So it's a pretty huge deal for us. So um check that out it's kind of my passion project right now and we're gearing up for um hopefully season two a continuation uh, of the podcast is looking pretty good at the moment so um that's a great place to find me right now monday night if you want to come check check out thirsty sword lesbians i think that's going to be a lot of fun so that'll be happening on monday i'm doing those uh one shot games kind of once a month um, and then at the end of the month, I'm excited to announce that I will be producing on my channel a Swords Fall campaign. Ooh. I won't be jamming or playing, but I am producing. Uh, Swords Fall is an Afro Afro punk uh, like futurism game, uh, and I'm uh, very very excited. It's an all BIPOC cast, and uh, that is being funded through the Fulton County grant that I received. So that's going to be a pretty pretty big deal. I'm very excited. So that kicks up October Tuesday, October 27th. So just a couple weeks out uh, for making that a reality. So those are some big things coming down the pipeline. For those of you that I heard, saw a couple people in chat all about that Overlight. If you like Overlight, guess what? I'm doing a little four episode mini campaign starting in November. So if you need more of that, you can get yourself some of that too. Um, I, I love Overlight. And then of course this Aliens campaign, Thursdays through October into November will be done right before I think Thanksgiving. Uh, but you can tune in and get caught up on that over on Unmade Gaming's channel where I'm making that happen. So, and I'm doing that with some of my besties. Uh, Zach, of course, is in that, um, as well as the Bubber Knot, who's a good friend. So, so it's. Um, so many things you can check me out in. That's what I'm saying right now. I'm doing a lot of crazy stuff. And then I've got a big announcement coming at the end of the month, which um, I guess my. Hopefully. Hopefully. I'll be able to talk about that during, uh, yeah, Infinity and Beyond. Okay. I think, because that's what, happening on the 30th or 31st? It's happening whatever, on the 30th, day, Friday the 30th. 30th. Th th into, Friday the 30th. into the 31st, so. I start, I the big announcement, my contract starts the first, so maybe I can by then talk about it. I mean... I feel you like know I'm what? You know close. what? You can be like, listen. I thought it was New Zealand time, and Oops. so Oops. you know. Oh, gee, I. Oops. You're, you're playing uh, so with Sod, so Sod's yeah. Australian time. I mean, so that's you know, true. Yeah. That's true. Um, and as for yes, uh, the Rising Tithes, uh, Overlight. If you want to check out the first campaign I did, that's up on my YouTube channel. That one's about eight episodes long. We visit every one of the shards, uh, but this is a continuation. You could call it an epilogue to that original uh, campaign. Is what this is going to be. That's good stuff. Um, I'm excited to see and hear more of that. And again, you this is not like uh, you will see you will definitely see much more of Dot on this channel going forward. Um, and of course, on her own channel and on on the gaming's channel and on various other places and on a lot um, of other places. Yeah. yeah, yeah so you will, you will um, right see. now, I definitely have a couple homes. Our van's channel is a home. Roll for it is a home. Unmade gaming is a home. And then the rest of the time, I'm kind of producing my own things um, in and around places. But those are my three big homes other than my own channel. Yeah, and um, but it's been great to have you as a regular co-host for this. So, uh, Thanks, congratulations sir. on all this stuff, Dot. Thank you so much, and we will will obviously see you soon in various places. Yeah. But you thank guys you, have thank a great you. night, and I'll see you at the end of the month. We're gonna close this out. I'll be under a veil. Just know it's actually yeah. under there, not Agatha. The costume is gonna be no jokes on these things. We're gonna <laughs> we're doing that. But thank you, um, Dot. Chat. Can we get some yeah. amazing love for uh, Dot? And thanks, Bye, Dot, so much. And catch you soon.
Okay. So, um, very good stuff. Now, one last thing that I want to mention for those of you who are watching uh, Masters of the Dungeon on the VOD, etc., before we switch over to D&D with viewers, I do want to mention there have been people asking me about the future of this show, and the answer is that I have a couple of possibilities. I have uh, one or two co-hosts in mind. I have to approach them um, to talk to them about the possibility of being co-hosts on this show with me. This show actually began, this is episode 30, and so this show began a couple of years ago with myself and the digital DM and Askren um, and uh, Will Jones from Encounter Roleplay. And then Askren left uh, because you step back from streaming altogether, or most pretty much altogether. Uh, and then uh, Will ended up having to leave because he had other stuff going on with Encounter Roleplay at the time. Um, and then uh, Little Red Dot came on and joined myself in the Digital DM. And then the Digital DM stepped away from a lot of Twitch stuff. And that meant it was Dot and myself. So the lineup has switched around over the years, and that leaves me back with me. Um, but I do have a couple of possibilities as options, and I'm going to be looking into that. So I would say watch this space. Um, there is the possibility of putting the show on a hiatus for a couple of months. It's not like I'm hurting for content. Uh, I definitely have other, could use the time, use the spaces to be able to put more of that content. But I also might do stuff uh, as well. I do want to keep it as a roundtable discussion because I think it's valuable to do this that isn't just talking about more game playing because I do a lot of game playing on this channel as it is and being able to talk about stuff like that um, is valuable. So we will see down the line uh, about how things go. This is not the end, I don't think, of Masters of the Dungeon in any permanent way, um, but it is something which may put us a little bit on hiatus for a couple of months, or as I say, uh, you know, maybe not for too long because I have to approach some people and talk about it. So we will see, but um, that will be the case. Yeah, there were a few times that just me and Digital DM. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's right. And, uh, you know, Dave and I did this, you know, did it a couple times as well. But if you look on my YouTube, you'll find it. But for those of you who have watched uh, myself playing uh, with Masters of the Dungeon, thank you for being supportive of this show in particular. And uh, thank you for those of you who watched myself and Dot um, over the last um, probably year or so that we've been doing this show. Uh, uh, as the sort of uh, the regular co-hosts, and I look forward to getting uh, more people involved with this uh, down the line. So again, 